All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Southwest Florida Tech Net, uh, and we are here, and we are live, and everything is well, and which is a great thing considering the storms that went through here just a little while ago, and a second follow-up storm that just went through here a few minutes ago. Uh, so we were just watching that on the radar, and it looks like uh, most of us will be in, in the clear. There's no more major storms out there. Um, I'm not using the production mic tonight. I ask you to forgive me. I know the sound's not going to be quite as good. Uh, that's because I'm already uh, set up for the Hurricane Watch uh, broadcast that's going to be going on immediately following uh, this net. Basically what happens, um, I put up a Hurricane Watch uh, broadcast. I started it with the last storm. This will be the second storm we're doing it. And I just want to come clear with you guys why I'm doing this. It feels like, why, why are you doing this? I don't understand. Well, I do it for a lot of reasons, actually. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I do it for one reason, because I want people that are not ham radio operators to see and hear and have a contact with, with ham radio. And uh, this does it by putting it out on YouTube. The second reason I do it is to also give ham radio operators a way to hear what's going on in the state as it's affected by the storm going by. It's good training. Uh, it's good uh, entertainment for people to just listen to what's going on. And this gives them a great opportunity to listen to a number of channels at one time. Um, and of course, the third reason I do it, and, and I'm going to be honest about it, I'm looking for hits. I'm looking for uh, subscribers. I'm looking for likes. I'm looking for people to hit that notification bell. You know, if you haven't done that yet, that can help this net more than just about anything else. We're trying to get our reach out there. We're trying to get more people to know about what we do so we can get more people to come into our nets at night and get more interest and there again, more resources and grow the, the tech net and also the tech team. Uh, and so one of the ways we can do that is to spread our footprint out on YouTube and by by getting more people hitting subscribe and ringing the bell and clicking the likes and viewing the videos, all those things help our algorithms. And those algorithms are so very important on, on YouTube. So we ask that you guys like the videos on YouTube and click the subscribe, ring the notification bell. And then every time we go live, it'll let you guys know we go live. Um, I'm going to go live for incidents of magnitude in the country, around the world. I'm going to go live uh, for big storm events here in Florida. I'm going to go live uh, anytime that there's something going on that I can broadcast that would be of interest to the public. I'm going to try to do that. Like I said, if for no other reason, to get what we do out in front of the public. Um, let's see here. Okay, uh, Joseph, I'm going to go ahead and make you the co-host. There we go, Joseph. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Joseph, KM4OBZ is my co-host tonight, and he will be presenting along with me tonight as we present to you guys a little topic that we like to call mobile radio installations, and then we're going to watch the tropics. Uh, and I want you guys to know that uh, I got to tell you, um, this is round two with the tropics, and we're going to also talk about round three, and we're going to get into that right after this. There's another one that's going to be approaching Florida Wednesday of next week behind this one. Uh, and then, of course, we have to watch the intertropical convergence zone for even more coming across. So we're going to do all that. Um, I'm also using my, uh, my virtual studio set up here tonight for the first time. So I actually have some different, uh, uh, different camera angles and some different things that we're going to be working on tonight. I have different ways that I can uh, set up the cameras. Uh, if you're ever wondering uh, what it looks like, I even have a quad screen here. This is the entire shack. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. There, there you go. In case you were wondering. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, basically, I've got this set up to where I can uh, switch it from any camera I want. Uh, Great, right on the first bald spot. Yeah. Don't you like that? You know what? I say go boldly. You know. They asked Patrick Stewart one time. Baldly, you said? Yes, go baldly to baldly go, where no haired man has gone before. And you know something? They asked Patrick Stewart one time, the man that plays John Luke Picard on Star Trek The Next Generation. They asked him, they said, Patrick, why is it that a man in the 24th century would be bald? Wouldn't they have cured baldness? And he says, no, they cured vanity. So anyway, there you go. Um, 
I don't care if I'm bald. I've got an old lady and she don't care if I'm bald. So there you go. All right. Um, yeah, I could do real cool stuff. Look at, check this out. Hey, we're on a bunch of little screens. We're in here. Um, yeah, this is really cool. I've been playing around with this thing all week, trying to do different things with it. Uh, and I hope you guys think it's cool too. And what do y'all think about our new logo? This is the new Southwest Florida Tech Team and TechNet logo. What do you guys think? Any any positive or negative comments? I think it's pretty cool. All right, cool. And the negative comments will be taken at eleven fifteen tonight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I'll be uh, sure to stick around for those. There you go. There you go. All right, guys. Well, um, I got to tell you, I uh, uh, we worked on this. Joseph had a lot of input in it as well. Uh, we finally came up with something we liked. Um, and as I said before, that before, I'm sorry if it's a little bit of a repeat, but just to give you guys a little bit of heads up why we did it this way. Um, I, as you guys know, I'm retired from public safety. I've done law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch. I've done it all. And I have designed patches that are still being worn today. One thing you got to do when you're designing a patch, you want your patch to be a design that when someone walks up to it, it will tell the whole story. And this does that. When you walk up to me working a radio in a tent after a disaster, you know that I'm from Southwest Florida. I'm an amateur radio operator and I'm on the tech team. And judging from the little pictures, I kind of do a lot of different stuff. And uh, so, and, oh, and by the way, I'm an American. That's what the top part said. Uh, I, I swore the next patch I designed would have uh, a predominant American flag in it. I've just, I've got a thing about that. So there you go. Had to do it. All right. So, um, all right. Uh, that's, uh, so that's our new uh, patch. We are right now, it's on all of our stuff online. And I'm already looking forward to getting it made into shoulder patches for about a dollar twenty a piece. We can have these stitched into shoulder patches. The only kick is I have to buy 200 of them. Uh, they get really cheap. If I buy a thousand, they're only 63 cents a piece. Um, but uh, if you buy 10 of them, they're like $42 a piece. <laughs> That's oh, ridiculous. Man. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it's because um, the, what you pay for a lot with these patches is setup. So you're, yeah. you're going to pay that setup charge one way or the other. And the way they do it, they roll the setup charge into the number of patches you're buying. If you're buying a thousand patches, that setup charge is divided by a thousand. If you're buying ten patches, that same charge is divided by ten. That's so you can see economies of scale. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Economy of scale, and it actually makes sense if you think about it. Uh, you're getting uh, basically a free setup. I mean, you're getting the setup rolled into the price. You just have to remember that when you buy. We're also looking at stickers and pins and all kinds of cool stuff. One of the things that other groups don't ever do, it doesn't seem as have patches and pins and all this cool stuff. And so we want to have some of that kind of stuff. We're going to see how far we can we can take some of that. If I can get enough people together. Uh, oh, my cat's over there. I didn't know that. If, uh, I was going to say, there's some kind of creature back there. That's Snotty. That's Snotty Maru, the uh, the uh, shack cat. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I'll, we'll do that. Anyway, so next thing, uh, let's go back to here. Tonight, we're going to be talking about some really cool stuff. And then I've got a few announcements to make afterwards. And I'll give you guys a little teaser. Um, we're not moving the time of the show. This net. We're not moving the time. But we are going to have to talk because we're going to have to do things a little bit different. The show, uh, I don't advertise for my, my commercial show on here. But as you guys know, I'm the, I am the producer of uh, Trey Radel's show, The Drive with Trey Radel. And uh, I have been his producer now for many years. I was his producer for uh, several years before he went to Congress. Uh, and then I did some work with him during his campaigns and stuff producing. And then after, uh, after he came back to Southwest Florida after Congress, uh, he went back on the radio again. And they called me the very first day and I was his producer again. So uh, Trey and I, uh, we, we do a really fun show. Uh, there's a lot of interaction between us, and it, it gives me a lot of airtime, and I like it. It's a fun show. Uh, I love producing that show. Well, uh, apparently the book likes it, too. Our ratings are through the roof. I'm actually not allowed to discuss all of it, but let's just say uh, we, uh, we're we nearly the number one rated in anything anywhere right now in Southwest Florida. So uh, uh, it's uh, it's huge. 
Uh, the show is huge, and they have given us a third hour. Guess which hour they gave us? The, seven the latter eight. half. Seven to eight. Yeah, of seven course, eight. of course. So, uh, yes, uh, yeah. For those of you, uh, for those of you who listen, you already know uh, it's going to end up being a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a mess for this show. Um, but I think with Joseph, and maybe if we recruit one or two others to help. What I want to do, I've made an arrangement with the show that I'm going to be leaving at 7.30 on Fridays. So I will still be here to open the show at 8 o'clock. I'm going to have the computer all on. Everything's all set up. Um, we will still open the show at 8 o'clock with me sitting here. Uh, but I'm probably going to need Joseph, and if Joseph's not available, someone else, to start the meeting. And then uh, and, and get everything going and that kind of stuff before I get here. So, but we'll we'll figure all that out. It's not a big deal. We'll talk about some more of that. We have to go later. sit in your chair. No, you don't have to sit here. You can do it from home. That's We're what's great have about to this. Control your stuff there. Right. <laughs> all our jobs here are work from home. That's right. So anyway, um, um, I hear meow. that's that's not my cat. That's somebody else's cat. Oh, that's my stupid cat. <laughs> that's fine hey guys i am a cat freak cats are always welcome in this show uh so um i i don't know any cats with call letters but it's not required um all right so anyway let's uh let's get right to it the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is mobile radio installations you know this is something uh, i've had a lot of contact with this over the years i'm going to be honest uh um I've installed enough radios and fire trucks to, to anything. When I started in my department, I was 17 years old. And I was the only one there that knew how to wire radios at 17 years old. And why was that? Because I was a CV kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's break, break, break. Yeah, it's pathetic, isn't it? Uh, so anyway. Um, 10 four, good buddy. 10 four, good buddy. Hey, whatever. It talked. And uh AM at five watts. I mean, if as long as they were in my block, they were good. Um, but anyway, so we, you know, I installed all the radios and the trucks and uh, did that for many, many years out there. And, and so I've had a lot of experience over the years with different kinds of installs and different kinds of issues that you get with, with uh, alternator noise and all these different things that happen. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about this tonight because um, – you got to have a radio in your car. Um, I'm not a huge HF in the car guy, but I bet you once I get one in there, it might be more fun. Uh, but right now, I, I do like having my uh, two meter in there. I want to get me a dual band in there. Um, and we're going to talk about all that tonight. Um, Joseph, do you have anything before we go to the next slide? Uh, not really, I don't think. Okie doke. All right, we're going to talk about radios. We're going to talk about antennas. We're going to talk about wiring where to put them, but we're going to start with what radio do you need and where do you need to put it? And you know what? There's some really cool radios out there. Uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, that, uh, that there's literally like, there's literally shack in the box radios that you can buy that are, that are literally um, the entire range of frequencies that you would normally talk on. And I'm talking uh, HF, uh, say 80 up to uh, six, uh, and then two meter and then 440, all the main stuff. And that radio, I got an FT100 over here. I bought from the club used for 300 bucks and it's a gym. Uh, so uh, you can put a really nice used radio in your car that will do everything you need to do. But just remember, if you're going to put an HF and two meter and 440 radio in there, you're going to need at least two antennas. Uh, so we we'll have to kind of consider that and we're going to get into that. Mounting is so important. When you're picking the radio you want, you might want to decide, is, do I, am I one of those people that like a really clean install? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that like me, that I'll plug it into the cigarette lighter and shove it in a hole and throw the mic up on the dashboard. That's good for a couple of weeks, but I eventually need to mount that thing. <laughs> I eventually need that mic to be on a hook. So it's not keyed up in the seat somewhere. Um, Sitting and so, minutes. yeah, you want to figure out what kind of radio is going to do best in your vehicle. Now, if you don't have a lot of money and you've already got a radio like me, I, I bought an old $15 Yazoo. That's one of my, one of my favorite radios. And it's great radio, but I, I didn't buy it. 
I bought it used, so I didn't really get to choose what kind of radio I got. Luckily, I drive a big old van, and it doesn't matter. I just I'm going to drive it on the crusher when I'm done with it. So I just put screw holes wherever I want. It's awesome. Um, so anyway, uh, the neat thing about uh, picking your own radio is if you've got a chance to go ahead and spend a few hundred dollars and pick you a nice radio, you can pick something that'll work in your car. Um, the choice of mini ham radio operators you'll see over on the upper right and the upper left. And that is a, uh, a two-part radio or a split radio. There's about 10 different names. I'm sure there's others I'm missing. Um, but basically, the radio consists of a radio and a control head. And the control head is a very thin, small thing that has a small little network cable that hooks to it. And uh, you can see one there on the upper right. Uh, that's actually a real common icon up there on the upper right. Um, I've seen that in several of the guys' cars, and they love those. It's a 5100. Um, yeah, yeah, those are good radios. That's all it is. Look at that. See the little wire going in the side? It's the size of your cell phone with four knobs on it. Oh, yeah. oh, but you have to mount the radio under the seat. So, you know, there, there's, there's good and bad. Um, if you've got a, an old lady that's picky about what the car looks like, you know, uh, the two, the two parter, uh, the two piece radio is probably the way to go because you can literally Velcro that right to a spot on your dashboard or something, and then just tuck the wire right in behind there. And it's clean, man, it's clean. Uh, so there you go. That's some different options. Lower center. That's more like you would see in a government vehicle, but I'll tell you what, I've owned these myself, these little stacking and tree systems that they have. They're really inexpensive. Um, if you don't find them in the regular websites you go to, go to a law enforcement supply website like Galls, G-A-L-L-S, Galls Incorporated. There's a lot of them out there like that. And, or just Google uh, buy uh, radio, a uh, multi-radio organizer, five radios or whatever, and it'll come up. They make these with or without the top cover, and uh, you can put as many radios as you want. I actually built one of these myself for a minivan that I owned about 30, 25, 30 years ago, and it had five radios in it. Uh, and back then the radios were a little bigger. Uh, and it was really nice because it went right between the seats. There was no center console in this van. Um, so there's some the different mounting options. There is uh, one thing um, go ahead. that I can say. Uh, so with a lot of these radios, especially the uh, ICOM 5100 up there uh, in the top right, the microphone actually plugs into the, the actual radio part, and the head is the only bit that uh, has the extended cable on it. So what you'll end up doing is put the head in the car somewhere and put the, uh, the radio in the passenger seat or whatever, and then you realize, oh, you still have to plug the, uh, the, the handy microphone into it, which is the most boneheaded design ever because why? The 8900, as you can see in the top left, has the microphone plugging directly into the head. So I don't know why anyone ever thought it was a good idea to put the plug on the base of the radio because it really causes problems. But you can uh, get uh, extensions for those. Like Say so what? My IC208 and 207 are like that. Yep. So you're kind of stuck. You have to get a uh, – a lot of them have RG11 as the uh, connector. So you'll have to get an extension for that. But you can also find them just by Googling your radio type and a microphone extension cable. Just a little quirk that a lot of these radios have, which is pretty frustrating, but something to keep in mind when uh, thinking about the radio. Make sure you check and see where the microphone comes out of the radio and take that into consideration for your vehicle. I think only the Elencos are really designed with the mic that plugs into the head like that. The rest uh, them, yeah. Yeah, and the rest of them have to go... Uh, you have to have a separate line for the mic to go back to the main box. Yeah, those will the Linkos, the TYTs. A lot of them have it going into the head, and then the uh, the older Yaesu radios, like the eighty nine hundred, there plugs into the head still. Um, this TS four eighty uh, is the same way. So wow, they could have easily accommodated the plug on that, but they didn't. Yeah. But they you know, Mo Motorola has been making these split radio systems for 60 years, and I've never seen one from them that has the mic plug into the to the transmitter. We used to mount those transmitters as far away from heat and vibration. Like if it was in my pickup truck, 
uh, I mounted it on the back wall behind the seat, up on the wall behind the seat. Um, yeah. Of course, they were a lot bigger back then. My Mocom 70 80 watt transmitter back then was the size of a mid sized piece of luggage. <laughs> and it had a handle on top and it had a 48 pin cable. You guys remember those? I know some of you do. Remember the 48 pin cable that would go yeah. down on top and you would screw it in? And then on the other side, it was 48 wires that you had to stuff into 48 holes. <laughs> and you just I, hope all I've the little numbers were still on. It. I know. If you've installed a MoCom 70 or a 90, there's there's a bunch of different ones. The 70s were the most common. Um, we had the two two channel models, the four channel models, and uh, we even had one six channel model. They actually had the crystal sets in them. There was a transmitter set of crystals and a receive set of crystals. And we actually had a little board that was in there that made the PL tone because they were they were made before PL tones. So we had actually have they had to solder a board in there to, to make the PL tone. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, Motorola is, is the, my favorite radios in the whole world of Motorola radios. I can't afford them. I like to look at them in books. They don't. Okay. Their handhelds are uh, Motorola makes handhelds too, which you can technically use for amateur radio. But uh, they make it almost impossible to use these outside of a like a, a full on business application because the software to program it costs like a like three hundred dollars. You have to get certified to use the software, which means you have to do like training. Uh, and the radios cannot be programmed from the actual radio, so they're really good quality radios with great sound and great art, great uh, transmitters and receivers in them. And they'd be absolutely amazing for ham radio, but uh, they, they, they make it pretty difficult to get into all that. And there's an exact reason why. And those are made specifically to be handed to idiots. Uh, a Motorola radio, when they hand you that STX radio or that MT-1000 or whatever it is they're handing you and you get it, it's going to have a volume knob that has a click for off and it's going to have 16 channels. That may be all it has. Because they know that about half the people that that radio is going to be handed to are morons. And so they're built for end users that know nothing about radios. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. They're, it's some of the best equipment you can buy. But keeping okay. everything so proprietary is also the way they keep their price way out of yes. line. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The prices are really high too, though. It's not like the prices that, are cheap. That, that that's what I'm saying. That's why they don't let the software oh, yeah. out to the public, and and yeah. why you've got to go to a training class to be able to use the software. It's not that the software is hard to use. It's so they can limit the people who can do it, so they can charge more. Uh, exactly yep. right. That's a hell of a note to have to be indoctrinated on how to use a radio. <laughs> I'll tell you, I have a love hate. I have the same kind of love hate with Motorola that I have with Windows. Yeah, uh, it's the best. It's the worst. It's the best. It's that kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, it's yeah. what's the alternative? Uh, the good thing with radios, uh, there actually is really good alternatives. Icom, Yazoo, Kenwood. I don't need to go any further. Okay, uh, let's see here. The next thing let's talk about. Guys, if, if you take one piece of advice from me, that's it right there. Don't use wire nuts. Um, Great what it, I'm going to tell yes, they're for house wiring. They're for solid core copper wiring. They work when they're able to screw on to uh, two pieces of solid copper wire, and they actually mechanically create a screw, basically, a bolt and a nut. Um when you put them on strangulated wire in a car and then you vibrate them down the road for two years doing this, they will come off. And when your positive and your negative one come off, where are they normally at? Right next to each other? So Happy 4th you know, of July. You could do the math on that one. <laughs> yeah. And the good news is if they're after your fuse, you've got a blown out fuse. If it's before your fuse, you need a car. You may have um, a car fire, yeah. Yes, and we're going to talk about that in a little while because manufacturers put those fuses near the radio. We need to move those fuses to the to the battery. All right. Uh, but anyway, please use crimp on or solder on. You do not need to solder it, but if you want to, you can, but crimp on works great. When you crimp, crimp the hell out of it. All right. Um, 
the basic install, and, and it stopped me at any time. Joseph and anyone else out there stop me at any time because I get on a roll and I forget to stop. Does anybody have anything up to wire nuts? I almost used wire nuts a while ago, but I ended up soldering it. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, if we're going out for a week to work a hurricane or something, wire nuts are fine. Just throw, throw a piece of tape over them so they won't twist off. Um, That's a good idea, yeah. A permanent install, negative, negative. Because it, it's not permanent. It won't be permanant, trust me. All right. Well, I heat uh, shrink and an AT&T splice. That way it can't work itself loose. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. I mean, there's a lot of really good ways. Um, you know, and then you get into uh, power poles, things like that. Great connectors. Yeah. Uh, and we'll get into all that. But um, but the basic barrel connector with two crimps is is all you need. You just can't... And, I'll tell you what, wire nuts are a good thing to have six or eight wire nuts in your go bag. You think I'm crazy? After a storm, when you're hooking the generators and you got to hook up this wire and you got to hook up this 12 volt wire to this car battery, and this, I'd have six or eight wire nuts. I, it's just something I carry in my go box, uh, in my toolbox, is a little bag with about 10 or 15 different size wire nuts in it. Uh, it's just something that's come in very handy for me over the years. Um, but I don't, like I said, I don't permanently use them in cars. Okay, so let's talk about install location. We pretty much already did all that. You know, there's the control head, and then you got to mount the uh, the bottom piece. Um, one other consideration I want you to make when you're mounting that bottom piece, besides the mic cord, which we already talked about, the other thing you need to worry about is the heat. Sometimes in some vehicles, the floorboard under your seat will get very hot on road trips. Okay. Um, what you'll find is, oh, it don't get hot back there. No, and, and maybe it doesn't get that hot, and you've never noticed it before. But one day you'll be stuck on I-75, and it's 97 degrees outside. And you've been in stop-and-go, bumper-to-bumper traffic with your muffler sitting right underneath that piece of metal. And don't forget the uh, heat radi radiating off the uh, black pavement. Right. You got heat off the pavement. You got heat from, from your, your uh, running system. You've got heat from your exhaust system. And it's and you got heat from the ambient air, and it's all coming up under there. You're making me think of that. I, don't know. <laughs> I sat in, uh, we, and, and a, a good example of this <laughs> my grandchild, my, um, I married into a grandchild. It's great. I, I never had children, but I married into one grandchild, and it's awesome. Um, we had a uh, a nice Kia Sorento that my mother owned, and we put him in that third row of seats in the back. He loved sitting back there. He had his own seat and everything, you know, one side up, one side down. He had, like, his own seat. Um, it was fine going up and back until one time we got stuck in traffic for two hours, and he kept telling us his feet are burning, his feet are burning. You just don't think about stuff like that. That floorboard was 130 degrees back there. Now, if you had a radio sitting there and you were transmitting on it, it'd cook it. Yeah. So I'm just telling you, be careful where you mount this thing. If you have to mount it under the seat, put 10 washers under your four mounting bolts so that it's got breathing room underneath it. That will help tremendously. Uh, and maybe put it somewhere else. Trunks don't generally get that warm. Uh, so that's sometimes a good place. Uh, but then again, it's that mic cable, you know, you gotta deal with that. Can we back uh, up for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, speaking of under the seat, I have found in the last several cars that I've installed radios in, they have an air conditioner duct under the yep. seat yep. to right. serve the back, the back seat passengers. Right. Yep. And so it's very convenient to mount the radio box right in front of that. And usually there's plenty of air circulation under the seat anyway. But uh, that to me has been uh, has been a great thing in, in several recent installations that I've done. There you go. Yeah, cars are so different now than they used to be. It's very hard to find enough cubic inches to mount something anymore like it's not like it used to be it's, uh, it's getting more and more difficult um you want to we're going to talk about install location for your antenna we're going to talk about that in depth in just a few minutes access to the battery because we're going to have to hook it up to the battery and we're going to need a place to hang the mic 
a lot more important than people realize. Um, you need a place to hang the mic, even if you just put a paper clip on a screw with a hook so you can hook your mic on it. You need something because if you don't, you're going to sit on it, you're going to break it, you're going to key it up, and it's going to be keyed up while you uh, go through a traffic light and start screaming words you don't want people to hear on the radio. I oh, I don't know that that's ever happened to me, but it might happen. Uh, let's see. Wiring basics. Uh, basic. Be, make sure that all the wired use is the proper gauge for your radio. This is so important. Um, what can happen if you use a wire too small? Well, I'll give you. There's, there's a bunch of them. Number one, your radio won't perform as well. Uh, number two, you're actually going to strain your radio because it's going to be trying to do a job with an insufficient amount of power. So you could actually be wearing your radio and aging your radio. I'm not sure. Uh, number three. Uh, you're going to blow fuses. Number four, you could even cause a fire or uh, burned lines, uh, starting to get uh, burned ends on your lines and stuff. Uh, it's just not ever, ever a good idea to have. You know what happens if your line's too big? Nothing. No. Uh, literally, as long as it's fused right, you, you could literally run a pair of jumper cables to your radio. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's <laughs> just, but if it's too small, it's a problem. Um, Run your transceiver power leads directly to your battery or your terminals or and, and try to avoid the use of automotive wiring. There's a few exceptions to that, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, there, you know, there's sometimes there's some accessories in your car that are big enough to handle that. We'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, try to avoid existing wiring because what will end up happening is, is you, you turn that bad boy, that FT100, up to, a, up to 100 watts. And you key down on that thing, and it's it is going to draw an inordinately high amount of power from somewhere in your electrical system where that amount of power might not normally draw. And so it's going to cause surges and changes in voltage levels. These new cars are sensitive to that stuff, not like the old ones. The old ones you could hook into anywhere. Oh, that's ignition. I'll hook in there. These new ones aren't like that. Instead of 40-amp circuits and 20-amp circuits and 10-amp circuits, there are three amp circuits and micro amp circuits, and you got to just be real careful in these new cars. So what I suggest, Joseph and I even talked about this a little bit. What we suggest is, in most cases, unless you have like a tow brake or something, and we're going to talk about that. But if, in most cases, don't even mess with your vehicle wiring. This thing needs to go through the firewall and right to the battery. Now, if it's a ten watt little QYT ten watt mini radio. Or if it's a bow fang hooked up to a cigarette lighter plug, those are okay. Anything over 10 watts needs to have direct wiring to the battery. Um, be careful when attaching multiple radios to the same feed line. Now, you guys know that receiving radios don't use that much juice. And you guys know that as long as we're only transmitting on one or the other, generally speaking, we can hook two radios up to one feed line. I'm just saying be careful here. Um, if your feed line's barely big enough, I wouldn't hook a second wire, a radio to it. If you've run a big old fat feed line that's like 8 gauge, but you only need a 10, you could probably hook your second radio up to that. And as long as you're not simul, we don't ever simulcast in amateur radio. So um, you're going to be okay, unless you're using it as a repeater or something. Yeah. Um, make sure to fuse with the proper size fuse. Uh, you can fuse the negative and the positive. This is something I actually recommend. Um, I know that what I call North Fort Myers engineering, um, it always makes sense to put a really big fuse, right? <laughs> that way it never pops. Um, truth is you really need to find out fr from your radio manufacturer, what amperage fuse and use that one for that radio. A fuse can actually save your radio. It can save your car from fire and it can save a lot of headaches. So you want it fused, not only fused, but fused properly uh, so and make sure the fuse is the proper size. And if you're using two fuses, one in the positive and one in the negative line, they both need to be uh, the, the right size for that radio. They it, it Don't multiply. If the radio needs a 20, you put a 20 on one side, you put a 20 on the other side. It's real simple. Uh, fuse close to the battery. This is important. Fuse close to the battery. You notice with radios, the radio has a wire come out and about one foot out of the radio, there's the fuse. And then you've got 10 feet of wire that goes to the battery. Now, let me give you a what if. You run it through the firewall. 
let's say that positive wire gets shaped on that firewall. If the fuse is by the battery, no big deal. You replace the fuse, it pops again, you realize you have a big issue, you track it down, you find the shaping. If you fused using the factory fuse by the radio and you ran that wire through your firewall and directly to your battery without fusing it at the battery, we'll see you at the car lot where you're looking at new cars because I, it'll burn that down right now. Burn it right down, I'm telling you. Um, a, a 10 gauge wire dead shorting against the firewall will cause a vehicle fire and it will, it'll burn it to the ground. And uh, we'll see how good that five minute response time does when your car burns up in three minutes. Um, so just uh, watch that. If you think you can't burn a car down with a piece of wire, I'm telling you guys, we've almost burned up a fire truck with one. Uh, yes, a dead short, a dead short will burn your car to the ground. I, it's just, it's your battery has enough power in it to burn 50 cars to the ground. It's kind of scary when you think about it. Uh, somebody had a comment, Rick. Yeah. Uh, now I ran six gauge. What I did was plan mine out such as I could hook several radios. So I ran six gauge wire, a pair of red and black six gauge wire through the firewall to a pair of 40 amp fuses. Uh, and you could use a little bigger, a little bigger. I, I we're kind of conservative there because I figured it, no way I'm gonna pull more than that anyway and hook that to the battery. So you got the fuses are right out there next to the battery. And then I come into a power pole uh, panel. And then what I do with the radio is I just put a power pole on the radio and use the factory wiring there. So you still got the fuse there with the radio. Right. Too. You've actually got two sets of fuses. The yeah. And if just like a house wiring, you have a master breaker and, a, and you have your uh, regular circuit breakers. He's absolutely correct. You can use as many fuses as you want. It doesn't matter. You can have it fused four times if you want. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, is it going to be a little more of a headache later if something happens? Yeah, maybe, but it might save you too. So, yeah, I and what he said about a big fuse out there coming into a panel, a bunch of small fuses for all the different things, that's the best case scenario right there. That's that's uh, because you're fused on the big wire coming in, and then each small thing has its own small fuse. Uh, or like he said, the factory fuse on the way to the battery, uh, on the way to the uh, radio. Yeah. Um, and then finally, well, the last thing there was uh, you want to protect uh, uh, you want to protect the wires against chafing. This is so important. Um, a lot of times we will want to move the grommet to the side and shove the wire between the metal and the grommet. And I really, really, really advise against this. What you want to do is find a grommet that has some room. And even if you have to get a little exacto knife in there or whatever, and you want to make a spot to get your wires through an existing grommet. Uh, a lot I ran, of times. I ran be, my wire through some heat shrink. Then I did something similar to that too. Right. It's always good to tape it or heat shrink the part that actually goes through just in case. Um, what I normally do is I look for a dead plug, a blank plug. A lot of times in these newer cars, you'll find a blank plug under there. And you'll see it's like a rubber plug, and you can yeah. pull it out. And if you can pull it out, you can get the wire through there. Then all you have to do is take that plug, put a little teeny slit in it that's just big enough to get your wires through so that you get a nice tight fit between the plug and your wires, and then just work it up your wire. And when you get the wire where you want it, pop the plug back in the hole and you're all set to go. Yeah, That's you need to make sure you have a good water seal too, because if you run into a puddle, you may have a little bit of a flood in your car. Yeah, if if uh, um, it's certain cars in certain spots, if, if you don't have a good seal on that firewall, you can get water coming into your floorboards and you don't want that. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to, of course, get into even more of that when we get into the intense uh, discussion here in just a minute. Wiring size and placement. Use the largest gauge wire you can connect the radio to the battery. Um, I've already gone through that. We won't go through it again. General sizes for a normal 50 watt rig, it's about 10 gauges. 10 gauge. Um, 12 gauge is the absolute minimum. And here's the thing with wire, okay? When you think about wire, you're thinking, okay, well, he's talking 10 gauge or, well, 12. Can I get away with 12? Are you going four feet? 
Yeah, you probably can. Are you going 20 feet? No. You got to remember that the distance the wire runs uh, means a lot about the amount of resistance you're going to get on the wire. So uh, if you if you're the further you go, the higher gauge needs to be. Uh, for a hundred watt rig, eight gauge is preferred. Um, and you, what, you know what's really great right now with all these big boom boom stereos that all the kids are buying? You can buy all this eight gauge fuse blocks and all this crap dirt cheap on Amazon. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, don't wallet, don't. Uh, like and I, I, not to diss on ham ham radio shops because I'm I'm starting to really like a lot of them. But um, I got to tell you guys, when it comes to just cheap stuff, like you need a let's say you want a big fuse block to go out by your battery that your eight gauge wire can go in and come out of, they they'll sell something like that on Amazon, dirt cheap, I right? literally dirt cheap with the fuse in it, everything ready to go, boom, you get it the next day. Um, uh, Walmart wires. Walmart, um, they've got stuff like that too, because they yep. sell stereo stuff there. And I will tell you, your automotive stores, a lot of them will sell your crimp connectors and your crimp stuff. Yep. Um, if you're not impatient, uh, it, it, please shop around for that stuff. Um, you can get a crimper with like a thousand crimps things to go with it for 20 bucks on Amazon. Uh, you go into the automotive parts store, you're going to pay that for the crimp tool in 20 parts. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a big disparity uh, on these like electronic parts between Walmart, the automotive store, and Amazon. You're going to find huge price differences. Yeah. Okay. So, but a lot shop. of times when you buy the cheap stuff, that's what you get too. That's right. Yeah. You buy junk and you're going to regret You know, on, on Amazon, Anybody can sell on Amazon. It's hard telling what kind of crap they're going to send you. That's right. Well, that's why we're, we're talking about crimp connectors and stuff. I, I've been buying this stuff off Amazon for years and I've right. had no you, issues. You, but. you go into O'Reilly's or AutoZone, you can see what you're getting. Yeah. You know, you can look at it. You can, you can tell the quality of it. You know, you buy it on Amazon. It comes in a box and you open it up and it, it's liable to be trash. Yeah. That hasn't been my experience, but I, I have gotten a few things from Amazon I haven't been proud of that uh, that were not great, uh, and uh, they took them right back. So uh, I can't really complain there. I, I will take. Can I can I say something? I I know there's there's Amazon lovers and haters in here. Um, <laughs> I I'll, I I want to tell you guys I had an Amazon experience the other day. It was a good one. Um, I, you know, I have a Prime member. It's one of the few things I pay for. I, I don't normally pay for subscriptions and things like that. Um, but I got the Prime membership because of the free shipping. You know, all you need to do is get a couple of packages shipped and you've paid for that for that Prime. Uh, and so I get we get a lot of, of different things out of it. Well, the other night, my alert started going off at two in the morning. I had apparently been purchasing gift cards. And uh, what they did, and I want you guys to watch out for this, what they did was they went in and purchased something that I had already purchased before and had it shipped to my house. And then five minutes later, they started buying gift cards because what they did was they stuck their toe in the water by shipping me something that I had already bought to an address that I'm at. But then they immediately switched to something that gets delivered via an email you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I came out to the shack at 2.45 in the morning in a panic. And I called Amazon. And they answered the phone. And I said, I don't know what to do. I'm in a panic. And they immediately fixed it, fixed it, fixed it. I said, what do I do about these antenna parts that came? And he's like, enjoy them. They're yours. So I got $8 worth of antenna adapters that I actually needed. Uh, so... It was a good Amazon experience. Uh, and I know there's a lot of other companies that make it good too when you get screwed over. And so that's a good thing. Um, hey, Ian. Yeah. What I did with mine, now I bought, uh, there's a company out there, they're in the ham radio space called PowerWorks. They sell all these, uh, these uh, what do you call them, power pole connectors and all that stuff. Well, I bought all the six gauge wire and everything from them. I had them custom make the thing. Uh, and I think that was a far better experience. Uh, the thing got here, it was ready to be installed. So right. I got that thing installed. And that's, how, that's how I did that. 
I used a 75 amp uh, power pole connector, one of those big guys, to so that I could hook the disconnect my uh, thing inside if I needed to. Uh, but uh, no, I, I've, I've sat there and planned it all out. I figured I'm gonna just run a two meter two uh, 440 rig to start with, but yeah, I'm gonna add more stuff later. So all I gotta do now, if I wanted to add a radio, just go out there, it's almost plug and play, plug it in. And I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, their stuff is good quality. They, yeah. It is a little more expensive than other stuff, but it, it's always good stuff. Exactly, yeah. it, it's good quality stuff. Yeah, so that's what I used. And you know, guys, it's when it comes to this kind of stuff, if you've got the money to spend, it's always good to spend the money. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have the money to spend, you can do ham radio on the cheap. Yeah. Uh, I just want it to be safe. I've been doing it for a while now. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can do it and, and you can do it also. You can do it very nicely too. So yeah. it depends on what you can afford. We, to each his own, you know. Uh, I've got my work's picking up, so I'm hoping I can get back into buying some better stuff myself. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to say about this, if let's say you've got a uh, a radio and you want it to go off when the key goes off, and you're like, I don't know how to, I, I if I hook it up to the ignition, then it's going to go against the rule to always hook it up to the battery. You're right. What you do is you buy a relay. They're yeah. cheap. They're five bucks, ten bucks, little relay. Uh, you might get a larger one, of what they call a, a normally closed solenoid, uh, if you want something that's more wattage. Like with your big 70, uh, 70 amper, you could actually buy what's called a normally closed solenoid. Why do you buy the normally closed? Because the starter solenoid on your car is a normally open solenoid. Yeah. And if you use that solenoid, it will burn out because it's not designed to stay closed for long periods of time. So you buy a normally closed solenoid, put that in your car, and on the solenoid, there's two big bolts and there's a little bolt, the two big bolts, battery in the one side, fuse, battery in the one side, and then the other side, the big bolt goes to your power stuff in the car. And then that little bolt, all it does is it's hooked to either power or ground, depending on how it's wired, and you just put a little switch or you can hook it up to your ignition system. So that every time you turn your key on, it connects that solenoid, that normally closed hey, solenoid. Go ahead, Hey, John. Ian, can I yeah. take the counterpoint now? Yes. You, you, you know how I hate, how I just love to contradict you. <laughs> no, John, John, I actually like that. I do. I do. Well, most of the time, sometimes here you is, just, you know. Here, no. here is the counterpoint. Most of the time, I'm just being obnoxious. <laughs> and by the way, I'm not an Amazon hater. I buy stuff on Amazon, but... I do like to support the ham radio stores because they support I the agree. hobby. And, and and you're you and granted Amazon will let you send anything back that you buy if you're not satisfied. I, I will give them that. Uh but I, I see big pluses to buy buying from the ham radio stores. Anyway, to to talk about your, your relay or your solenoid, so the radio goes off in this with the switch. You know, that's expensive and that's a lot of hassle and that's extra wiring so extra possibilities for something to go wrong most modern radios are processor controlled radios and most of them have a timeout timer in them that will shut them down after a, a pre-programmable period of inactivity so you know you set it for 90 minutes and the radio runs for 90 minutes after you've not touched a mic button. Most of them will even beep. So if you're on a long road trip and you haven't talked on the radio for a while, it'll give you a little beep signal and, and warn you. And then you just you know click the channel selector or, or something and, and let it know you're still paying attention to it and you love it and uh, it'll go on. But uh, it sleep on you. You know, if, if you park the car and forget to turn the radio off it'll go off in you know 30 or 60 or 90 minutes or whatever you have it set for anyway so i personally have never done the relay i just do that works and yeah if your radio has that that's always the best way to go uh absolutely um yeah i and you know what my big 
uh, ICOM base radio uh, does, if I hold the power button, it starts blinking or something. And after like an hour, it shuts itself off or something. I, it was something like that. But yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see here. Um, and that's pretty much all for that. Uh, we've already talked about that. We've already talked about that. So let's move right on to the next one here. Um, when we're talking about your car, we're talking about power. And uh, as we know from uh, amateur radio stuff, we always have to make sure we have the sufficient amount of power for what we're doing. And it's the same thing with car batteries. We don't think about it with our car because the, the power is always there. We turn the ignition to power is there. Um, we just want to make sure that we're not wearing it down too much or that we're using too much. Here's the thing. Like, let's say, what are you going to be using this for? Are you going to use this as a radio to, uh, to talk like the guys do early in the morning on the way to work? Uh, no big deal. Uh, you probably fine with the, your battery and alternator and everything just the way it is in your car, just the way it is perfectly fine. Um, but let's say you're going to put a hundred watt HF rig in there and you're going to go do, uh, what do they call that? Scouting or roving and contesting and things like that, where you're going to be CQing and you're going to have a 30, 40% duty cycle sometimes when that happens, your battery is going to become depleted and your alternator will not keep up and it causes a lot of stress on your alternator. It also is not good on lead acid batteries uh, to have uh, uh, con continuous voltage spikes. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that if you're going to use your car and you're for, for something other than just talking, you know, having a little bit on the way to work, you want to make sure that you're providing enough power for your car. And you can do that several ways. You can add a second battery. That would give you more talk time before you run into trouble or a larger alternator, which means that any time you're running, you would be OK. I can't really tell you exactly when you would need to go to a higher power system. I can tell you that in the fire trucks, we used to run 50 and 100 watt radios in the trucks, and it was never an issue, uh, even in the staff vehicles and stuff like that. I, we would be in a staff car for hours using multiple radios and phones and it's, it's generally not a problem. You get into the problem where you're dealing with hundreds of watts and or, or you're dealing with a station that's going to be doing an inordinately high amount of transmitting. You may want to look at beefing up your vehicle's power system. Does anybody have anything on that? I mean, if you're driving a small car, uh, it'll probably have a smaller everything in it, including battery and everything. If you're driving a bigger truck... We don't have to worry about it as much. Yeah, and another thing, you go and and run a kilowatt, you really got a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's when you need a separate battery. And yeah. I'm going to be honest with you, it's the size of the vehicle is not as much important. Although I will admit, trucks will always have bigger alternators than cars. Yeah. But what you want to look for, and I'm going to, this is where it's crazy. Okay, you can buy you a base model Nissan that has nothing but the basics. And it comes with a 60 amp alternator. Okay. Um, if you go buy a Cadillac DeVille that's fully loaded with everything it comes with, that thing will have a 120 amp alternator in it because it's got heated seats. It's got, you know, it's got all these other features and extra lights and extra, um, uh, you know, the uh, seats that are automatic and all that. It's got all electric windows, electric locks. It's all, everything's electric. If you buy a base car, you're going to get a base car. and It doesn't need near as much power, and you're going to find a much smaller alternator in it. Conversely, a big truck, an F-350 with a towing package, that thing's probably got a 160-amp alternator already on it. So you just got to check and see what you have and do a little math and see where you're at and what you might need. I guarantee most of you are probably fine with what you have. Um, if you're worried... Buy you an inexpensive amp gauge and just start to watch your amperage while you're while you're operating. Okay, next. Um, here's a uh, we've got just expelling a few myths here. Um, I found these. This is some stuff that I've even heard in the past too. Um, uh, if you take a lot of people think that uh, you should never run your coax and your power wires together, like in the same loom or in the same wire tie or in the same part of the car even. Not necessarily true. If you're, uh, uh, we're talking 100 watts or less, if your feed line 
uh, is if it's fine, if there's nothing wrong with it, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, twisting the positive and negative. Have you guys ever looked in a car where they've done an install and the positive and negatives twisted? They even make a thing that goes on your drill and you go, it'll drill. It'll twist the positive and negative cables around and make like a, a braid out of them. And they do that because they were told for years that that decreases the amount of noise coming through the wire. Again, not necessarily true. Same thing with a brute force filter. There's, they make filters that you can put on your radio because you're hearing noise and things like that. Um, what you find out, uh, ferrite beads is another one, okay? I'm not going to get into it, but ferrite beads can be installed on power cables. They're basically worthless. Here's the thing. If you're using ferrite beads and you're using um, brute force uh, filters and you are twisting your lines and you're doing all this stuff because you've got all this RF noise or all this alternator noise or all this whatever kind of noise you're getting, it's a crappy install. And you're just you're basically fixing a crappy install. And you don't need to do that. What you need to do is reinstall it. You need to change the wires. Maybe you got a wire that's got a, that just, it's got some impedance. It's just not right. Maybe you got a fuse adapter that's not getting a good continuity there. Maybe it's it, it's got some issues. Maybe the way you've got the wire run. Maybe you're running right by the ECM for the car, or maybe you're running uh, along with the the loomed wire for the car, and maybe that's causing some of the wire the bleed through of noise. There could be a lot of reasons why you get this bleed through. Um, of course, anywhere near spark plug cables is going to do it, but we shouldn't be anywhere near those. Um, so you just want to make sure that where, wherever you end up, if, if you start getting a bunch of noise, a bunch of whine, you ever heard somebody talk on a radio and you can hear <laughs> while they're talking? Yeah, that is called alternator whine, and it's caused by uh, a lot of times a bad alternator. I could, this is called. You can do all this crap that's listed up here. But the problem is your alternator is about to go bad, <laughs> so it could be a lot of problems. A lot of times you'll find grounding in a different spot will help. Grounding in multiple spots will help. Um, rerouting your cables, rerouting your antenna line. There's a lot of different things you can do before you try brute force filtering. Uh, before you try ferrite beads or any of that other stuff. Truthfully, I've never tried any of that stuff because my if you install it right, it's good. You don't need it. Um, if, another piece of advice I have, if you're going to extend your factory uh, power wires, don't attach another wire on the end of the factory wire and keep going. Just replace the entire thing as far back as you can. Make it one long contiguous run of wire that's slightly larger than what the radio came with. That's my suggestion. If you do that, you'll never have trouble. A lot of times a radio will say it needs 10 gauge wire, but if you look at the wire that comes on it, it's 11 gauge wire. You're thinking there is no such thing. Yeah, there is. These, these Chinese, and, and this goes to what John was saying earlier, and he's right. When you order wire from China, it's not the exact gauge that you think it is, maybe. Um, I, and a lot of times when uh, cheaper radios and maybe even some of the other ones, I don't know. Uh, but I read this on three or four of the different things I was reading for research that says a lot of these radios will tell you to hook it up with 10 gauge wire and it will come with wire that's somewhere between 10 and 12 gauge. I guess the Chinese have a gauge thing like they do the power thing on the boat. Yeah, end. it's a conversion thing, you know, depending on what uh, week it is or something. I don't know. But anyway, and then uh, the last one, uh, go ahead. Uh, do you want to talk about this one? Uh, yeah, Joseph? sure. Yeah. Um, this is kind of just from my experience, what I did uh, in my, I have a, I drive a 2004 Suburban um, and it has a trailer brake controller wiring that was built into it. Um and I found that the wires on that were actually thicker than the radio wires. And um, I ended up soldering uh, my radio leads to that. And those wires were located underneath the uh, steering wheel. So they were ideal to wire to because I didn't have to go through the firewall. All I had to do was run the cable back underneath the dashboard and down. And it, let, and it gave me a really nice spot to wire to. 
I know most cars are not going to have a trailer brake controller system in them. Um, but if you have a truck, uh, that's a good, another good option for wiring it. Um, that's what I did. And I think that was done in another vehicle we have. I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, the wires were nice and thick and, uh, there was no controller in there at the time. And so, uh, I wired it to that and it's been working great ever since. And it saves you from having to go to the firewall. Cause I did look through, a, look for a firewall hole and I couldn't find one. And I would have had to tear the whole dash part and climb around upside down into there. And that can be really difficult, especially if you're older, even me, who's, you know, bouncing around all over the place. I had trouble getting underneath the dashboard. So trailer brake controller wires, not everybody has them, but if you have them, it is a good place. Just make sure you uh, wire them to the correct, you, you put a meter on them uh, and you check them to make sure you have the right polarity because they're often marked with colors other than red and black for power. I think like positive was blue for me. Um, wow. So make sure you get the wiring correct. But yeah, trailer brake controller wires. It's another yeah, way to do it. If you hook it to the wrong one, the radio will only work when you push the brake pedal down. Yeah. Uh, you don't want that. <laughs> the more you slow down, the, the more power you get. <laughs> That's right. Let me, get on the radio. Let me jam on the brakes. <laughs> yeah, hold on. I got to stop and talk. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, that's another thing you can do there. There's uh, there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's the, getting your wires through the firewall is going to be the hardest thing you're going to do. And a lot of people that are going to do 25 watt radios are going to hook them up to the car system and they'll probably be okay. That's why just, I ran this. Certainly not recommended, but. <laughs> yes. Yes. Porcupine. Porcupine. Okay, this is the question of all time. To drill or not to drill? That is the question. Shakespeare wrote about this. Um, this is uh, one of the age-old questions. Um, and, of course, you don't make this decision. Your wife does. So, um, But you have to decide, or she does, whether you want to drill a hole in your car to put an antenna in. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. I am, I am absolutely sold on permanent mountain tenants because that's all I used in the fire department for years, even in my personal vehicles. At one time, I had a Dodge minivan that had a communication set up inside. You wouldn't believe it. Had, it had, I think, seven or eight permanent mountain tenants all the way down the middle of the roof. It looked like a Mohawk. And uh, <laughs> matter of fact, they called it that for a while. But anyway, um, it worked great. And uh, the permanent mountain tenants... Why would you drill a hole in your wife's car to put a permanent mount antenna? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Okay. I'm going to be totally honest with you and tell you why. It's the best way. It's permanent. You take the headliner down, you drill the hole, put the little thing on, you put a little silicone, you do it right, and you run that wire down, you run it down the A post, you put it all back together, and you're good for five years. That antenna will never give you an ounce of trouble for five years. Uh, there's no other option out here that's going to give you five years of service. I'm sorry, there just isn't. Uh, so that's that's the, the big thing with permanent mount. Um, drill a hole is the best way. And you know what? You can get a little rubber grommet when it's time to sell the car. You can even get them in colors, and they'll pop right in the hole. And it's really not that bad. Uh, you can hardly tell it's there. And uh, and you know, just do what I do. I, I drive a car till I drive it up on the crusher. Uh, let's see here. Um, the best way to get permanent mount, well, it just, it requires no maintenance. That's the biggest thing about permanent mount antennas. They don't rust. They don't require maintenance and everything else. It is really easy. Uh, the next kind, the next most common one is going to be your magnet mount antennas. Here's your problems with those. They scratch the paint. They rust. They cause rust lines. Um, if you ever see a car with, with a red, like, circle somewhere on it that's a rust line from a magnet antenna um these are temporary you shouldn't consider a magnet mount as a permanent install because over the months it will ruin the paint that's under the magnet i'm just telling you it will um you can buy what they call rocker panel stickers i know this is crazy i actually read this while i was reading for this it's called rocker panel stickers. It's actually a thick sticker. It's clear. And you could buy that and stick it on your roof and then put your magnet on that, and that'll buy you some time. Um, it also reduces the amount of stick you get. 
uh, slightly lower performance over magnet mount and, or over permanent mount antennas, but you know what? Not as much as you would think. They actually do pretty good. Hazards include flying off at speeds and during accidents. Um, I was a firefighter for 17 years. I never worked an accident where someone was injured by a flying magnetic antenna, nor have I ever heard of someone being injured by one, but you never know. Um, my biggest thing was I had to stop and put it back on the roof because it got knocked off by the tree branch. Uh, the lip mount or trunk lid antennas. These are probably the next most common type of antenna. Uh, these are great. They've got a little hook and they basically hook underneath the lip of your trunk. I want to tell you guys something. If you ever listen to me with these things, you put them on, they look great. They work great. There's two big drawbacks to these. Number one, they're going to rust wherever those two little metal screws screw into your underside of your uh, trunk lid. They're going to go through the paint. And where that happens, water is going to drip around that antenna and come up underneath. And it's going to rust out your trunk lid. Under there. What I did with mine, now I use that type of mount. I took mm -hmm. some clear fingernail polish and put around it once I got it installed. And that there you go. Water from getting in that, getting in that place. There you go. Or just goop the heck out of it with silicone. Just put a big old Gotta wad of silicone through. all around it. Yeah. Go um, around that. Else you're gonna, like you said, you're gonna get rust. Yep. Yeah, I've seen these where the it, there's literally it just destroys the trunk lid. It, it causes a huge yeah. rust spot. Uh, and then the other thing is, if you're putting this on the side of your trunk, you're not in the center of your ground plane. And it's going to affect performance. Uh, you want your antenna to be as close to the center of ground plane as possible. So you might want to put it on the middle of the trunk lid uh, by the back window instead of over on the side. Um, some other antennas you can try. Uh, they've got like a temporary little hitch mount or a permanent hitch mount. They make like a wreath receiver that goes into your wreath receiver that has the antenna mount on there for your big HF antenna or whatever. But they also make a little one like you see there in the upper right corner. It's like a little clip on. And uh, it's like a temporary or I guess kind of could be permanent a little bit. But you clip it on there and there's your antenna right there. Uh, the bottom one there is called a chassis mount antenna. Uh, that is actually a big bracket that bolts on to the chassis up underneath the motorhome. And then comes out in front of the motorhome. And then it has the tower mounted on top of that. So... Uh, that's a great rig right there. Uh, and then, of course, when he gets where he's going, I know that must telescope. It's, it has to. It has to. Um, it's a screwdriver antenna. It looks like a tar heel or something like that. Yeah. Um, the hardest part of mobile installation will be choosing and placing the antenna on your wife's car. Um, and it's not placing the antenna as much as it's getting her to let you place the antenna. Uh, now, you want some other options. There's always other options. Here's some really cool ones. How about a luggage rack mount? You could actually mount an antenna right on your luggage rack. Any kind of extrusion on the outside of your car. Mirror mounts. If you drive a truck, even some of the newer mirror mounts, the, the new mirrors, the new plastic mirrors, they actually do make mounts for some of those, and they also make mod kits. So there's different things you can do with that. A headache rack mount. You can mount those, again, on anything on the outside of your car. This next one's really cool. Um, every car, every one of these new cars that has the plastic bumper has a tow hook location on it, on the front and the back. It's a little square. It's about one inch by one inch. You pop that little square out, and there's a, a spot where a bolt screws in. And that's how the tow truck tows your car out of the ditch when you put it there. Um and uh, it's pretty cool because you can also use that as a way to mount something on the outside of your car that otherwise has no way to mount something on the outside of it. Now, um, with, with one of these that goes down so low like that, you're going to have really bad performance because you're going to have the metal car body sitting right next to it and you're going to have no ground plane and it's going to be a foot off the ground. Yes. So it seems like the worst spot you could put one, but I guess it would work if you absolutely had to. Yes, I agree. I, but it's if you're stuck with options, 
This is something you could throw on and go out and then come home and take off, you know. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you noticed the bracket he's got on there. He's actually using the factory eye hook that came with the car. And he's got like a bracket that's pancaked on it. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I don't know. I, you're, I agree with you on the performance. That's probably going to be the crappiest performing antenna up here. And then the last one, again, you can mount it on any accessory that you have on the outside of your car. can be modified to hold uh, an antenna also. So just some different ideas there. But this is going to be one of the hardest things you're going to do, getting that wire through the firewall. Uh, when it comes to that, getting the wire through the firewall, it's going to be a very difficult thing. And then finding a place to mount that antenna is going to be, it's going to be difficult. I don't care what you say. It's just going to be hard to do. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's stop there. This, uh, that's one, la one, la one last thing I want to mention, Eon. Eon. Yeah, we're not, we're not going by. We're going to actually take comments from everybody on the vehicle mount. We'll start with you, uh, Rick. Okay. Uh, there's a great website out there, k0bg.com. I don't know if you're aware of that. Kilo0bravogolf.com. He has got, uh, that is the website on mobile uh, ham radio installations. So if you want to look at that, uh, that's got, yeah. So you don't want to miss out on that. That's got a whole lot in there. Uh, a bunch on alternators, as you can see, antenna efficiency and everything else. So oh, it's wow. a pretty good site. So you might want to look at that. Well, there, there's my website of the day. I, I don't have a website of the day tonight. So there it is. KOBG.com. Uh, KOBG.com. All right. Yeah, that's that's a nice resource. All right, and yeah, and, uh, into all of the all of the nitty gritty about you know running high power and uh, antenna efficiency, mounting antennas, and uh, got a whole lot of pictures in there of uh, different installations and everything. So I figured this would be a good site for you to look to take a look at. All right, one of me talks about if I can mount my fifteen hundred watt kicker in the trunk. Yeah. <laughs> that might be the good news. It's bad, bad news when you key down, your car comes to a total stop. <laughs> you know, it would be worth it, though, to drive down the neighborhood and watch all the TVs go off and watch all the street lights go off. And... <laughs> Does anybody remember the Robin Fireflies? Uh, I guess not. Uh, back in the CB days, when CB was big, Robin CBs made these antennas that had a little neon light at the top end of it. And when you transmitted, the tip of the antenna lit up red. Oh, that's cool. They called it the Robin Firefly. Oh, that's really cool. You could probably make something like that. Just take a diode and an LED and mm -hmm. uh, put it on the end. Might work. The only thing mm -hmm. I didn't see, Ian, is, you know, how am I going to mount my rotor on, on the car? Mm. With my yeah. Yagi. Yeah, I know that's a problem. That's like probably like a hitch mount kind of thing. Yeah, and you want the Yagi face that or a luggage when you're rack, driving. Maybe. <laughs> you know, that's why trucks have two uh a lot of trucks will have two C B antennas next to each other, like one on either mirror. It's because that actually forms a uh, a more directional radiation pattern. It it goes yeah. forwards and backwards. Down the highway. Those in the C B days. Oh, Double talks? Was it here last week that I saw now they're going to allow them to put FM on CB radios? Yeah. Yep. 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 Cool. Yep. Next they'll be doing CW. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing you know, they're going to want to add stereo FM. <laughs> <laughs> no, the people are going to do that. <laughs> yeah. you, guys gonna know, you know what I can't wait for? Breaker Breaker FT8. Yeah, you know there's a there's an 11 meter slow scan TV <laughs> frequency. Oh my gosh! And I really? am like, has anyone in the history of time ever used that? That's what I want to know. <laughs> oh man, the pictures that would come from CB radio. Oh my gosh! I can about imagine. <laughs> Might not be suitable for young young viewers. <laughs> uh. Yeah.
All right. Anything else on uh, mobile installation of amateur radio equipment? I do want to mention one more quick thing I just thought about. Someone mentioned to me in an email today uh, about tonight's topic. Uh, they said that they also needed to know how to mount a mobile radio as a base radio. Um, and I, so I just want to talk briefly about that. That's something that's really straightforward. Um, all you need is a power supply. Um, I, uh, any base radio, any mobile radio can be a base radio. That's what's great about it. You just need to have a big enough power supply. Um, I've, I've got a 15 amp power supply here. Now, that powers anything. It powers my 100-watt Yaz, do it. will power my 50-watt VHF, whatever. Um, that, that's a great little power supply. So what you want to do is buy you a power supply. They're about 50 bucks. Get you a decent power supply uh, that, uh, that's 15 amps or so. And then just whatever mobile radio you have there just hooks right up to that instead of the battery. It's literally that straightforward. As far as the antenna, you could literally buy a... Like, let's say you want a, a, a radio that you can use in your house and in your car for a few months until you can buy a second one. That's not a problem. You can even take your magnet mount antenna and stick it on an oven pan and stick that outside your window and you'll probably be able to hit the repeater. Just make uh, sure that that uh, make sure that that pan is is magnetic. Apparently, it's got to be magnetic for the thing to work. It can't just be conductive. Huh. Yeah. There's something about the, the it, it gets a lot of its counterpoise through the magnetic connection somehow. I, just, I, I was reading about that. It's interesting. Yeah, aluminum doesn't work well. What yeah. works well though is if you get one of the 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 grids or the grates that go inside of the full sheet pan things that are made out of steel. Those work great. That's what's underneath both of my mag mounts here. Yeah, first thing I do when I get to my cabin up there is uh, I take. Uh, I go inside and grab two cookie sheets and I, I stick two magnets on them and I go stick them out and up on top of the shed or wherever I'm putting magnets, uh, the antennas, and I run the wires into the inside of the cabin uh, and hook them up and they work great. I mean, I, I, I hit the repeaters with them just fine up there. So uh, making mobile radios into base radios is a lot easier than making mobile radios into mobile radios, actually. Yeah. A nice touch I like to do is I get those uh, rubber feet. You can get them just about anywhere and stick on the bottom of the radio. So you can sit yep. down and scratch everything out. Yeah, I'll tell you what I like to do. Uh, I like to mount my radios underneath shelves. Um, I a put a shelf idea. right here in front of me. There's a shelf right here. You can see it right here. Yeah. Uh, and I will mount radios using the brackets that came with it, like the vehicle bracket. I'll yeah. screw it underneath that shelf. And then I'll mount the radio up underneath the shelf and then hang the mic next to it. Uh, you can see here, I got the, the mic here. It just hangs right up on the, on the thing. And I like that because everything's just right there. It's nice and handy, but yet it didn't take up room on top of the shelf and it didn't take up room on the table. So that seems to be the best way to mount base radio antenna. Uh, base radios is to mount them uh, in, in the vehicle bracket underneath the shelf. Yeah, that works very good, dude. All right. Anything else on mobile radios or anything around that? Oh, external yes. speakers. I want to mention yes. that real quick. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, Rick, you can go first if you want. No, go ahead. No, okay, this will, be, this will be quick. Um, a lot of these radios, uh, maybe not the, the ICOM ones, but I know for sure that the one, uh, the FT8900 has a very bad built-in speaker. It sounds very, very tinny. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and guess that the uh, TYTs, uh, the, the TYT 9800, which is a clone of the 8900, and probably a lot of other bass radios are going to have built-in speakers that just don't sound very good. Uh, so um, when you're planning your setup, uh, a good uh, external speaker will go a long way to helping your audio sound nice and, and juicy because um, they make some really good speakers. I have this uh, Jetstream speaker here that I uh, have screwed up on the wall next to me. And um, I think it cost me like $13 at Gigaparts. And it is, it sounds fantastic. I mean, it's, it's all you need for, uh, for <coughs> FM radio like this. And it will uh, turn that tinny audio into something that actually sounds decent. So um, that's another thing I want to mention real quick is, uh, and then, and, you know, if you're installing your base and you have a separatable head and the, and the, the base of the radio is somewhere else in the car, you're going to definitely need an external speaker because that 
built-in speaker is going to be under a seat or behind you or something, you know, audio is going to be a bit muffled. So, um, yeah, external speakers. Those are some that, uh, good ideas. Yeah. Obviously, if you use an external speaker, uh, well, if you, if you mount a radio under the seat, you want to use an external speaker. And, you know, you can put it up someplace where you're going to be able to hear it, uh, back of the console or someplace like that. Uh, uh, if you do that, if you're not using the radio speaker anyway, when you mount the radio, mount it so the speaker in the radio is facing down. Mm. Uh, keeps you from getting dust in the radio. Also, you know, if you spill a soda or a beer, it's not going to go into your speaker and ruin the insides of the radio. I <laughs> I have seen that firsthand. So uh, when I use an, an external speaker, I always may mount the speaker side down yeah so the heat and also so that the heat sink faces upwards the heat sink is usually on the other side of the radio and so uh yeah you know heat, heat sinks an important thing to discuss here real quick because if you've got a heat sink on the back of that thing or a fan in the heat sink which a lot of them have that has to be open all the way around it you really don't want that heat sink pressed up against the carpet on the bottom and pressed up against the carpet on the back or shoved down in between the seat where it just doesn't get any air. If you're the guy that doesn't talk on the air and all you do is listen, you'll probably get away with it. But if you do a lot of talking, you may burn your radio up. It's going to overheat like that. So I would just I would worry about that. Another thing we learned in the fire department, you know where we used to mount the speakers? Right above the seat belt thing right here in the corner oh, right behind yeah. your head and what yeah. we found was we would actually in the trucks we'd mount one speaker on each side like this a motorola speakers and every time we got rid of old motorola radios or they quit working we'd always keep the speakers because we would mount a speaker on each side above the seatbelt thing on each side and then when you're sitting there with your helmet on or whatever that speaker is literally six inches or a foot from your head so you could hear it really easy so now, if you are one of those people that you, you can't ever hear the radio in the car, consider buying a small, high-quality radio speaker and mounting it right behind your head, right up by your headliner. You can probably do it up there without even drilling a hole. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else on radio installations? Ian? Rick, did you, yeah, Rick, go ahead. doing anything with wings or do you want me to turn this off? Ian, uh, I want to say thank you, everyone. Uh, tonight's been extremely informative for me as a new ham. <clears throat> I have an, uh, I'm use, I've been using for the past year my ICOM 5100 as a base station, but uh, I have a mobile antenna and uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> a couple of, couple of questions and uh, points that I'd like to uh, put forth, if I may. <clears throat> First of all, um, yeah, on the uh, on the speakers uh, that I can I was my I'm in a condo and I have and my wife uh, doesn't want to hear anything re radio <laughs> me talking uh, you know any so uh, so I'm in a separate you know I have my separate room my what I call my shack and uh, I was I was contemplating but I'm I'm tied to that room when I'm listening as if like tonight, I, you know, if I, so uh, what I was contemplating is the ICOM 5100 offers a Bluetooth uh, component for under a hundred dollars. And I've got a Bluetooth uh, speakers, head, 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 headphones. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, looking into that option. It's uh, <coughs> supposedly pretty simple to hook up. And I didn't know if anybody uh, had a Bluetooth uh, system i can tell you that bluetooth are i, I use them here uh for my uh you know for work and your range is rather it's limited to i think about 60 feet so it's not real real you know if you if you have a problem with that yeah it's not gonna be enough yeah 60 feet would be uh, plenty in uh, my particular situation so that's great thank you uh thank you rick for that yeah um as far as uh headphones uh, in general, 
I have these cheesy headphones that I've had for years with my PC. When I went to the ham fest and uh, saw what some of the uh, professional guys were using, uh, they had the really nice headphones going into the HF systems. And they were like um, Idio. I didn't, uh, as a brand name, I-D-I-O, if I have that correct. Uh, is there, uh, even though it's, uh, do you have any input as far as headphones for mobile systems? Or maybe hmm. they're not, you shouldn't well, use them while, while you're driving or what? Well, okay. For, for, for driving, you don't want to be wearing headphones. Right, that's, right, that's, yeah. that's definitely not something that I'm sure there's right, some rule against right. that. But for at the, if you're stationary, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these uh, mobile radios will not put out audio that is going to work well with a set of standard computer headphones. The audio will uh, only be out on the left side or the right side and uh, it, it, it'll be way too loud or you won't be able to turn the volume low enough. So yeah, if you're going to get headphones, you should get some specifically designed for a radio. Now, I haven't actually found any yet that um, seemed like they were a, a, a fair price, but I don't know much about these. Um, you can use computer headphones. Right now, I'm using computer headphones, but I actually had to make a little adapter um, to take that left channel and turn it into a mono uh, on both sides of the headphones. So you can use normal computer headphones. You just might have to make a little box that goes in between them to, um, if it's the, if the audio is too loud, you got to put a resistor in there. But um, yeah, that's something to keep in mind for, for headphones, from my experience. Well, Joseph, if, if you use computer headphones on your 8900, don't you hear uh, one frequency on one ear and one frequency on the other? I do not. And actually that functionality does not happen with the, uh, with the, with the audio out. It only works if you use the, um, the eight pin plug at the back. Huh. That's Apparently. Interesting. That's interesting. Cause mine does. I, I have a pair of computer speakers plugged into my 8900. I wonder if it's a setting. Maybe there's a menu and, setting. Yeah, well, it could be, and, but it splits the audio. Hmm. I, I'm gonna have to see if there's a menu setting on this then, because I've I've tried it before and I have only heard out of the uh, the the left channel is the only one that had audio, or maybe it was the right channel. But um, are you I'm gonna sure have you to check the plug all the way in? Yes. Now, if oddly enough, if I pulled the plug out a little bit, then it would start going in both sides. But that's just because I was shorting the the right. pins. Thank you uh, for all that. Um, uh, I have a question as far as, you know, this Icon 5100, when I was, contempl I, I was contemplating, uh, well, I have uh, extended it out and uh, used alligator clips with uh, extended wiring, but I, it took, I couldn't figure out for sure what the gauge was of the wiring coming out of that. I'm thinking it's a 12 gauge so somewhere now that I know it's an 11 gauge wire could be possible. I'm, uh, but uh, I'm thinking uh, it's a 12 gauge uh, for a uh, for a mobile connection. You're recommending, uh, you know, 10 gauge would be better, but I, uh, 12 gauge would probably work, right? Yeah. Uh, how many watt? How much? What kind of wattage are we looking at? Uh, well, the uh, 5100 is a max. That particular is a 50 watt, which is about 35, I think. <clears throat> It was just a it was just a question as I didn't really need an answer. I was just uh, wondering uh, why would they come out with a twelve gauge lead on uh, on a wire if you're rec if it's recommended to go like a ten gauge? I'm just curious. <clears throat> I I, uh, I read online that a lot of these uh, more inexpensive radios will come with a say a, a fifty watt transmitter. And normally you would want to use a certain gauge wire with that, okay? Right. And what they do when they get the wire, they test it and they realize that the wire that came with the radio, the actual lead on the radio, is a half a gauge or whatever you want to call it, uh, smaller than what they actually recommend for their radio. It's just a way of cheating. Yeah, but and the order, RD5100 anyway, isn't a cheap Chinese radio. No, it's not. No, it's not. And and most, I, I'm sure if it's an ICOM or a Yazoo or a Motorola or even a Kenwood, uh, it's about all of those. But, but I sure still recommend like it. that you can get away with that. The yeah. idea of the bigger gauge is to pull the power over a longer length. 
I mean, right. That's, that's why if you remember, I, what I was really recommending was if you're going to extend the length of the factory cables, you just don't want to extend the factory cables because we don't know how good the gauge of the factory cables is. That's why I was saying yeah, you yeah, want to right. come right out and go into something a little bigger and then go all the way to your battery with one long run. I don't yeah. like a lot of broken. I like one long piece of wire. <clears throat> Another thing is I have, uh, you know, uh, when I go HF, which is going to be soon, I hope, and uh, uh, I was uh, looking at like doing uh, parks on the road and stuff uh, with a little HF system and even using uh, the, my uh, uh, trailer hitch, just like the picture you showed as a uh, hitching post for a uh, telescopic mast that would uh, lift an antenna. <clears throat> uh, they have some out there. Um, and uh, so that would solve the problem of being close to the car, even though uh, I don't know if a lot of these cars today, you don't know if it's a metal or a fiberglass body. And, uh, but that's just a point of information that I've been looking into different telescopic uh, type masts that you could hitch to the car or to a, to, to anything else. Right. I, I, um, the, the last point that I was going to at what uh, one point I was going to ask you, uh, Ian, is, uh, you know, this discussion on uh, leaving a radio in inside the interior of a car on these hot Florida days. Um, even if the radio was turned off, would the heat, ha in your opinion, have any bearing on the electronics? Well, uh, okay. Uh, I'm sure. I, here's the thing. Our sun destroys everything down here. I have a uh, screen that I put up in my window at work, and I park under a tree here uh, because I, I don't like my old Yazoo being out in the sun. Uh, and my portable, my little portable that goes everywhere with me, my favorite little radio, this thing, I take it inside with me and put it on the counter at work when I'm at work. And when I, when I uh, go to leave, I put it on my belt and take it back out with me because I don't want the, the heat will ruin the batteries in these HTs. So, yeah, I, I do believe that there is harm caused by it sitting in your car every day at 148 degrees out there in the parking lot every single day. I do. Um, and what I recommend, and, and, and this is just me, and please, people, jump in if you have a different idea. I paid $15 for the radio that's in my van. It's, a, it's an old mil spec. It, it has 16 channel memories. It's two meter only, but it's a Yazoo, and it's a great radio. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's a mil spec, which means that if you're out in a boat, you could use it as the anchor, too. Um, this thing's tough, man, out in the sun all the time, and it's great. And I still put the screen up in the window to protect it from the direct sunlight because I don't want it to get messed up. So I guess my suggestion is if you're going to permanently mount it somewhere in the car, um, maybe not. Maybe don't buy a big expensive radio. Maybe buy some something a little cheaper. Um, that, that's well, definitely a consideration. Go ahead, John. I, I've had my Yezu in uh, the same radio in through three three different vehicles and it's never caused a problem i've never bothered bringing it in and ian i know you're going to get a chuckle out of this i have a uh, little bofang uv5r that i carry in my car and just leave in my car as a backup every <laughs> month or two i bring it in and run the battery down and recharge it and go. put it back in my car just to uh have an extra HT if I'm out someplace and need it. And, you know, I it's ridden around in, well, it's ridden, ridden around in four different vehicles. So, <laughs> you know, you, you wonder about things like that, but I'll tell you, in my experience, it's never been a problem, yeah. either with an H, HT or a mounted radio. Yeah, I have an IC208 in my car. And that, that rig came out, oh, it's been, it's at least 10, 12, maybe 15 years old. And it's been in, it's in its second car and it's been in the Florida heat. Now I put the radio itself is down in, down underneath the, 
Uh, there's a little compartment in the Ford Escape, which is meant for, you know, uh, hiding place and all that. Well, that's where I put the radio unit. Then the head just goes up front. And uh, when it gets real hot, I just take it and stick it under the seat. So that's that works fine. So and plus, I've got a sunshade that I put in. If I got to go out in the car, most of the time the car's parked in the car in the garage. It gets hot in there too, but I've had trouble with it. Uh, uh, the thing uh, is, most of this uh, stuff's okay uh, until you get up to the extreme temperatures. And I'm going to tell you guys what's worse than the temperatures is the direct sunlight. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Just last point, and thank you very much for putting up with this. Uh, uh, what curious? So, uh, what range do you get with your five watt uh, Beofang? Uh, you talking like radio to radio, like Beofang to Beofang? How about radio to uh, repeater? Oh, um, my little five watt Beofang. Uh, I talked on the two twenty repeater. I'm at about five miles, and I was five nine last night, full quieting with my little with the little stock. 220 antenna that came on it. Um, I, I, you can get into, I, I'm good with anything within 10 miles. You can get into a bow thing. If you're standing, using it correctly out away from everything, you should be able to get into any repeater within 10 miles. Uh, does anybody have another, another answer for that? It's been doing this longer than me. I just wanted to control. Mention. Go ahead. Uh, Kilo One Hotel Quebec whiskey. I've been playing around with the bay fine for the last couple of weeks, several actually. You want to ditch the uh, dummy load antenna and get a, one of these 15 to 19 inch, uh, oh, Nagoya or something like that antennas, uh, which uh, improves things uh, amazingly. The radio is not bad. The audio is a little low. You have to kind of yell at it. Uh, and there's really no way around that without performing major surgery under a microscope, and I'm not about to go there. Uh, a couple other notes from the night. Uh, heat in the car, just if you have an HT, throw it under the seat. Uh, for antennas, Larson makes uh, glass mounts, uh, one glass mount, actually, and uh, it works quite well. You probably want to put a ferrite bead on the uh, coax about 19 inches uh, in from... Uh, from the glass, and it just glues on. The mount glues on the outside, the uh, uh, receptor, if you want to call it that, glues on the inside. And that's, eh, let's see, that's about it for notes. Bayfongs are fun to play around with. <laughs> it's dirt cheap, and by, you really do want to use Chirp if you use a, a Bayfong, Bayfong or a Wei, whatever they call it, Wuxan or whatever, because keying it in otherwise is, is agonizing. Over. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know it or not, but just recently, they listed programming a Baofeng in the Geneva Convention as prohibited torture. <laughs> and that's the news for the day. All right. Uh, so, yeah, though, it's bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, they mentioned at one of the exercises I went to in Charlotte County that we should all be able to program our ba a Baofeng from the front. Uh, of the radio and I said yeah that's great I said instead I said how about I have three ways of programming it in my car uh, but you have to be able to swear in Chinese <laughs> yeah there you go yeah you got to be able to talk in four letter <laughs> Chinese words uh, yeah, otherwise not for me. you might want to program it with an axe although I will tell you I have two Yezus that are not they're not user friendly either. So it's it, it's it's hit and miss. Even my my nice icon icon that I really like could be more user friendly with the menus and stuff. I don't know what it is about amateur radios. I think it's like you know, these are the smart kids. So we don't have to make this stuff easy. We can just make it. <laughs> I, you know, I can program any of my Yazers from the front with no problem. The Bofeng, yeah. no. No, I don't. I, I I don't know enough Chinese cuss words to do that. By the way, RT systems do make programming cables and software for the Bofeng. That's a waste of money. Now, now, granted, if you buy the software and and cable, you pay more, more than the radio. Than the radio cost. 
<laughs> but yeah. that table will work with all the Bofangs yeah. and most of the Kenwood HTs and, it'll work with and the something else. And so, you know, if you've got three or four different radios that you can use that one cable with, it yeah. makes it a little more worthwhile. These are O'Shings and they work with those too. Because I know when I bought these two radios, I bought the cord, I bought the programming cable with them, and I found out they're interchangeable. So I won't buy any more of them. Well, and and since we're doing portables, let me just tell you what my one thing on portables, and I'm going to be done. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you done? Uh, were you done, Rick? I'm sorry. No. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I, um, I, Ian. Yeah, go ahead. I just got one quick thing, and I'll, I'll sign off. I uh, we did a we had a range test uh, for handhelds. Uh, two weeks ago at the Cars Group, uh -huh. and I had never transmitted on my uh, Beofang UV5R 5 watt because I don't. I only thought it had a five mile range, and nothing's within five miles from here. I ended up putting my uh, well. I keep a 15 inch Nagoya 771 antenna on it. I ended up being able to hit the uh, Punta Gorda. Was it WX4E? Repeater, yeah, that's a, that's a great machine. From Venice Beach, 15, wow. and a half, 15 and a half miles coming through uh, coming through loud and clear. I could have went further, but we ran out of time. But uh, yeah. I just wanted to note that. And uh, thank you, for, everyone, for uh, great input tonight. Excuse me. Yeah, and I just, I just want to mention one thing real quick. When it comes to the, the HT antennas, um, watch for counterfeits. I know you're thinking. Oh yeah, Nagoya thinking? makes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Nagoya antennas. A lot of if you got a Nagoya and it's doing good for you, good for you. You need to go to the uh, Bayfong store when you buy that stuff, and, and the and the and the uh, Bayfongs also. Otherwise, uh, you're at high risk. Right. You can also a uh, B Tech is another place you can go that sells all the Chinese stuff that, that you can pretty much trust where it comes That's from. Kind of anyway, fun. I want to show Chinese you guys something. Chinese knockoff of Chinese radios. Yeah, you know, isn't it screwed what up? A you, you can get a knockoff of a knockoff. Anyway, um, this this is a Comet antenna, okay? Uh, it's, uh, you can see right there, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an actual Comet. This is, this is a, uh, about a $20 cool. antenna. This little antenna right here, for your eighteen doubles, dollar Bofeng, doubles the performance of my Bofeng. It yeah. doubles it. I cannot believe this. It does better than any of my long Nagoyas. It does as good as my forty eight inch Tactical. Yes, yeah, so and they also sell a BMC version of that, which I have sitting in yeah. front of me, which works quite nicely on my ICOM stuff. You know where it kicks the most ass? Four forty. Really? Yeah. It loves 70 Sims. Anyway, all right. Um, so that's that's basically that. If you're going to buy these antennas, guys, uh, and, and here I'm going to say it, beware on Amazon because you could get uh, you could get one that is not real. Um, and if you find a Nagoya that seems cheaper than the other Nagoyas, uh, I'd buy the more expensive one. I'd spend the extra eight bucks and buy the good one. And buy just go buy it from B-Tech or from Baofeng or from one of the reputable knockoff dealers ian how about that you said something i agree with yeah there you go john we're on a roll tonight buddy this roll. all right Cinna cinnamon we're on a freaking roll tonight i'm telling you guys all right um it's uh does anybody have anything else on mobile radios or any of that kind of stuff uh anything to do with mobile radios or uh, anything we've been talking about so far Okay, we're going to move on. It's about 9.45. Oh, somebody's on a 6.85. Well, good. It's um, artists. Yeah. So anyway, um, just want to remind everybody that I'm going to start the live feed up afterwards. So in the morning, if you guys want to check in, I don't think the storm's going to be anything. Uh, I really don't. I, I think what we're going to end up with here on this one is a big zero, uh, which for most people is a good thing. A lot of uh, rain. Yeah, I think I noticed yeah, I, the last cone draw that it was further out west than it within the one at the one at uh, two and then the one at the, the cone at five is a good bit further west. Now if it goes up the way that describes, 
it's going to be 100 miles off the coast at its closest point, which is fine with me. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got that right here. This is the current forecast. Yeah, and that could change uh, again and go even further west. Yeah, I think it's still going west. Yeah, they had this thing way over here on the coast just literally 12 hours ago. Yeah. Uh, and it was wagging left yesterday, so I figured it would wag back right today, but it didn't. You want to know why it didn't? Because earlier today, this thing was supposed to track right along. Can you guys can you guys see my mouse? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I see. Uh, it. it was yeah. supposed to track right along here, the North coast. and it did. And when oh, let's see if I can see it. can't ask for better than that. Oh, I know, I know, and um. When, when this thing this thing came across down here and it was supposed to come up like this and hug the Cuba coast and then come around and go right up like that. And what it did was when it was it came over Hispaniola and right about there, it was gone. There was like literally hardly anything left of it. Yeah. And the convective center kept moving along this line. But it, at some point right around here, it reformed down here over Cuba. Yeah, And so it's now taking this further south track because of the fact that of the reformation of, of the center of circulation. Anytime you have a reformation, uh, a reformation at the beginning point of a track significantly changes downstream, as you guys can imagine. And yeah. so that's what that that's literally um, that's literally what happened here. So yeah. uh, what do I have to do to clear this? You have to click two buttons because you know clicking one button just wouldn't be good okay <laughs> um yeah so uh i want to show you guys you guys always uh, of course know that uh the best the best place to uh the best place to get your storm information of course you can get it from the, the uh southwest florida TechNet uh website and that if, if you guys are just regular normal folks that don't care about hurricanes that much you just like to find the latest information the best place to find it is right here under weather and you can click hurricanes and uh there we go and uh, you click hurricanes it'll take you to our hurricane page and i update this every day uh the graphics update automatically so it's always the latest uh the latest information but uh this will give you everything you need to know uh right here in one quick page if that's what you want this will give you all of that in one quick page now if you want to go more in depth, I don't know why this is taking so long to load, uh, but this gives you literally the basics right here. Everything at a glance that you need to know, and uh, then you can go down and get even more. Um, if you want to go more in depth, you need to go to Mike's weather page. Uh, Mike's weather page, which is SpaghettiModels.com. Um, Mike's weather page is an amazing page. Uh, other than I think he drinks a little too much. Yeah, but he's is gone. that the same guy that makes Mike's harm hard lemonade? Yeah, as much as of it as he drinks, probably. Um, he's uh, th this is the guy they call the drunk donkey, but uh, he actually has a great website. And I'm going to tell you right up front, he's not a meteorologist, doesn't claim to be one, uh, but he has a great, he has the best website when it comes to uh, tracking hurricanes. This second column right here is always the current storms. There's Fred. You scroll down. Oh, and there's the other one that we got to talk about here in just a few minutes. And the track on that one's turned to the left a little bit. Not good yeah. news there. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when you're up here on his weather page, these are all the different things. Now let's take a look at. Uh, uh, we'll take a look at the satellite image. It's, it's still a little too soon. We we don't really see too much on the on the large radar here. But the storm center is down here somewhere. I don't. I don't really see much of a. Oh, it's out over to the right. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. really see. That's yeah, funny. I don't. I don't really see much on there. So, um, but uh, but he'll have everything that's associated with this storm right here, all right here. So you can just go right down and pick what you want. This is a great graphic. This is the one you guys really need to be looking at. It's, I don't know why it's not the most important graphic. This is the intensity forecast graphic. This one's so important because 
this one tells you what the model, how strong the models think it's going to be. Now, this one here on the left here, this goes forward in time. So time moves to the right mm -hmm. and intensity moves to the top. Okay. So in other words, 30 mile an hour winds or 30 knot winds. I'm sorry, 30 knot winds. Um, this model believes it's actually going to lose strength. This model believes it's going to gain strength, okay? And so you okay. can look out ahead. If you go out in time, you can look here 72 hours out, three days out, and you bring that up, and it shows you what each model thinks the intensity is going to be at that moment in time. This, to me, is one of the most important things, and it's suppressed. It's in the background. Like, it's not a big deal. This is what destroys houses, not the track. It's the intensity. Uh, so, but this, this is the, the one thing I'm always looking for uh, is the intensity. And, of course, uh, this is on Tropical Tidbits. He links you to all this stuff automatically. And then, uh, yeah, we could take a look at the satellite. This is the latest. Uh, of course, we're going to have to do uh, infrared because it's dark. You guys know how that works, right? There's visible satellite mm -hmm. and infrared satellite, right? Uh, this one here is, uh, why won't it scroll down? Stupid thing. Uh, this thing, uh, this is showing you but, uh, the, where the center of the center of circulation is not underneath the ball of convection. You guys notice that? Yeah. Where, where, where's your central dense overcast is way down here. Your circulation's up here somewhere. You know, yeah, uh, where, the where did they say that they're saying the circulation of this thing right now is sitting right there. Okay, that's yeah. going to put it right, like right in here somewhere. And uh, I don't see it, really. Although on the infrared satellite, it's kind of hard to see low level circulation. But the point is, is um, I don't see a strengthening system here right now. It's sitting over land. I don't think this, I think this is going to literally be a non-issue for us. I really do. Yeah, I think it will too. As yeah. far away as it's going. So we can go on down. This is the latest uh uh, this shows us the latest uh, missions. These are all of the NOAA training missions that are going on, or, or not training training missions and regular missions. Oh, no. They're all listed on here. Boy, this thing is running slow, but I guess it is doing like 50 things right now. Okay, here we go. Uh, these show you each mission. This mission right here is a low-level reconnaissance mission. Their status is they're in the storm right now. This is the aircraft position bearing. Uh, this is everything you need to know. This is the aircraft data. And this shows you where they're at right now with the current barbs. See these blue lines? These are weather barbs. And what those show you is wind. However many barbs there are is the wind. One full barb is 10 miles an hour, and then it goes up from there. Um, so you can kind of see the barbs. They'll also turn colors as, as the winds pick up. This one shows you the track. Uh, and it also shows you if they drop any drop sons, and I don't see any drop sons. Uh, drop sons are really cool. Drop sons are these things that they drop from the bottom of the plane through a tube. It looks just like that thing you'd use at the bank with the teller. And yeah. they, they put it, it's basically that, and they stick it in this tube, and it goes thunk down through the bottom of the plane. And when it drops out the bottom of the plane, this drop son as it's falling through the atmosphere and it's moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, the, the thing is taking readings like 10 times or 50 times or 100 times a second. And it's taking the readings of where it is, how fast it's moving, the torque and where it's moving. But not only that, the pressure at each level in the atmosphere, as this thing's dropping to the ground, it's taking pressure readings all the way to the water. And then when it splashes into the water, someone finds it, they call a phone number. They send a box to pick it up. Oh, okay, so they they do float. I didn't know if they did or not, or if they just. Oh float. yeah, they they not only float, but many of them are retrieved and used oh. again. Uh, and these are all different missions. You can see the different mission here. This one came down through Florida. Not all missions dive through the eye, folks. Some missions involve small planes that fly way out around the storm to give us what they call an environmental picture of what's going on around the storm. Uh, so there's all different missions. So you can check all those missions out there. Now, let's talk about the next storm, because I think this is probably going to be the big news topic for, for this coming week. 
uh, this is uh, this is kind of a big deal here. This this storm here is uh, is going to come right up to Kisser again. Now I want you to notice something. The the probably if I had to uh, pick probably the most important thing about this storm. It's right there. It's going to have to go over Hispaniola again. Every mm -hmm. time a storm has to go over Hispaniola uh, uh, and, uh, and the that's Dominican Republic, that's good news because there's a tall mountain range that sits right along here. So mm -hmm. when this storm gets here, it starts to whack it up as it gets all through here. That's what's happened to the last two. And it looks like that might be what happens with this one. Now, where we run into the problem with these storms uh, is when we get to the point where we get one here that sneaks just above the island and it does one of these numbers. That's where we have to worry about that. Or if it slips down below. Yeah. Uh, right you now. You can't clone the Espanola and have a whole load of them from Venezuela on the way up. <laughs> yep. Well, there's a lot of, there's actually some mountainous areas in Cuba. Yo, yo, yo. I don't, I don't know. No, echo, echo. So um, anyway, the, the main thing we need to be concerned about with this storm right now is the fact that this, this, I don't, this trajectory right here is a little scary. I mean, that, that's going to, that, storms don't turn on a dime. So this is going to wag back and forth. We'll probably see this thing wag back and forth a little bit, but it is going to come somewhere in this area. Now, how strong it's going to be, who knows? That the intensity is a big one because, again, uh, we got to look at what we have to go through here. This thing's going to go over some small islands. These are really not going to be a problem. But we get to Puerto Rico, um, which, by the way, Puerto Rico already has tropical storm watches up for this system. Yeah. And this system, I don't even think this system has a name yet. Um, but it's forecast to be a tropical storm. Notice there's no H's. So oh, at yeah. this point, they do not forecast it to be a hurricane. No. That's but this one is a, another one on that hook, that alley-oop trajectory that we get where these storms like to do this this time of year. Oh, yeah, they, like, wow. they like to come across that intertropical convergence zone and they like to come right up and then they like to do that. That's a dangerous situation for Southwest Florida because that puts us into a landfalling or a scrape and go situation. And, yeah. um, you know, everybody yeah. always talks about, oh man, landfalling storms are the worst. Landfalling storms are the worst. Oh my God, landfalling. No, they're not. No, they're not. You know, the worst storm we can get is one that comes right up the coast, just like that. That's the worst case Donna. scenario. Hurricane yep. Donna. Uh, Donna came in and went in and out and in and out. Donna stayed over the state for the longest time. My, my mother uh, survived Hurricane Donna down here. She was in a home over off of Canal, uh, uh, near Evans and Canal over in that area, that South too. Street. Yep. You were probably, honest to God, you were probably not more than a mile from where my mother wrote it out. Yep. Um, in downtown Fort Myers, right near downtown. Yep. Right over, she she's one block from the railroad tracks over there. I uh, was where she used to live, and um, they wrote it out in their house, and they had major damage. Though the difference is, and and this is where I I think a lot of people um, a lot of people kind of forget. Uh, we always talk about with storms. We always talk about uh, the number one thing is the intensity, and the number two thing is the track. And yes, those are both very important things: intensity and track, intensity and track. Yes, but the number three most important thing that's just as important as the first two is duration. Duration is the one thing people don't take into consideration. Yeah. Duration is the one thing that saved people in Charlie. Charlie had a devastating eye wall that lasted yeah. for four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you imagine Charlie's eye wall lasting for six hours? Which one? Any, could you imagine Charlie sitting over Punta Gorda for six hours instead yeah. of 12 minutes? Well, Donna Charlie, Charlie was moving. It was like going 30 miles an hour when it came through. And it was a little teeny wee storm. It was really, really strong. And it devastated a very small area. 
Charlie almost had the characteristics of like a big tornado almost. It was yeah. like uh, a narrow track uh, for, a, for a hurricane. Yeah. Um, and so Charlie, of, of the four things we look at, track, intensity, uh, and then, of course, your uh, duration uh, is going to be important. And, of course, how it makes landfall and when it makes landfall, day or night. Those are all the different things that are, are how dangerous the storm is when it makes landfall. Well, and, the uh, one was Dorian, which was over there. At the, that's the one that was uh, over at the, the uh, Bahamas. 185 yeah. mile an hour winds for a couple of days. Yeah, and, and I was getting, I was getting to that with Donna and with that one with Dorian. Um, these storms lasted for days. Donna yeah. went on. There, uh, Fort Myers had hurricane force winds for uh, 25 to 30 hours. Um, it went on and on and on, and they got the eye. My mother remembers they went outside during the eye. It lasted for over an hour. They yeah. actually decided to switch houses and went and stayed at a relative's house during the eye because of the way the trees were breaking and moving. Yeah, uh, it was so about something in the afternoon. <laughs> Charlie's eye lasted about four or five minutes, and you were back in the eye wall again that fast. Yeah. So. So again, duration is a big thing as well. Duration, duration, duration is huge. And then what's the fourth thing? We've talked about speed, you know, the, the intensity of the storm. We've talked about the track of the storm. Those are all very important. Uh, and we've talked about duration. Uh, the last one, the last big one is size. And that's where Charlie was a really small storm. Katrina was a huge storm. You know, Katrina was only a Cat 3. It was almost a cat too. I mean, it was almost, it was like, but, but why did it do so much damage? Several reasons. One, it was a winding down storm. What you find is a storm that's winding down tends to carry a lot of its previous energy. Yeah. Number two, Katrina was about five times the size of Charlie. It was just devastatingly huge compared to Charlie. So you can't put those two in the same boat. I mean, they're literally two totally different storms. Um, you, you you could fit five or six Charlies inside a Katrina. Uh, just just a, a, yeah, probably more than that. It was crazy the size difference. Uh, so <clears throat> the size of the storm is another big, huge consideration. And so when we start looking at storms, um, I don't like the category system. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't like the category system. It's based on wind. Wind speed only. And that doesn't tell you crap, folks. Oh my God, it's a Cat 5. Charlie was a Cat 4. But it only caused devastation over a 20 mile wide slot. Yeah. Okay. And Andrew Katrina was, was a Cat 2 ish 3. Yeah. But it completely wiped out a state and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the system Katrina, working? Rita and Wilma are all like that. Yep. So I, I don't like the the Saffir Simpson scale. I don't I, I don't like it. I've never liked it because I believe that wind speed is only one of four very important variables. And if, by telling people it's cat three, it's cat four, I honestly believe that the government uses that just like the Delta variant to scare people. It's yeah. anytime the government needs people. And I'm not going to get into a conspiracy story here, uh, a, a show here, but anytime. They need the public to do something. They do it by scaring you. Yeah. Do this or your butthole will fall out. I mean, that, that's literally how the government gets people to do things. And uh, unfortunately. And so the Sapper Simpson scale set up, it's a cat five. It's a cat five. I, I wish we had a better thing. I think that a good rating system would, would have some kind of four number system that would culminate in an overall score. Um, I think the overall score should not be a number. It should be a word. I think you should take the wind should be on a cat zero through five scale, just like we have now. But then I think the size should be on a zero through five scale like we have now. Okay. And I think the duration of the event should be on that scale as well. If you've got a storm coming in at three miles an hour and it's going to sit over that place for a long, long, long time, 
that storm should rate a lot higher than another storm that may have quicker winds, but it's a lot smaller and it's only going to be over the area for 20 minutes. Hmm. So there's a lot of things like that. I really have not been happy with the way that works. I just, there's so many variables in a hurricane to only take one variable. That's like rating cars on how fast they go alone. Hmm. Doesn't matter how comfortable the seats are. Doesn't matter how pretty the paint is. Doesn't matter how good it drives. All that matters is that SO, you know what, goes 150 miles an hour. That's all that matters. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the way we do hurricanes. Mm. All we care about was what happens when you push the pedal down. Mm. Truthfully, the older I get, the more I care about the seats. Yeah, um, yeah so I don't well, you know. know. Tornado I, ratings are the same way. Yes, uh, the Fujitsu scale the same way, yeah. Yep. It's... Uh, you know, size matters there too. I mean, you yep. can have an EF5, which is uh, a few yards across, or you can have one. You had one out there in Oklahoma that was two and a half miles wide. You know right. that what that two and a half mile wide one, even if it's an EF3, is going to do a hell of a lot more damage than that little guy that's even an EF5. Right. And I will admit the Fujitsu scales a lot closer to what I would consider a reality point. Yeah. than the Saffir Simpson scale. Yeah. Um, I think the only one of the three that got it white was probably Richter. Yeah. But anyway, okay. Um, does anybody have anything on the hurricane stuff? Do you want to, does anybody want to talk about this stuff anymore? I think the, uh, 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 well, let me, let me let a pause in there. Is there anybody that has anything else they want to talk about? All right, real quick, let's go through just a couple more graphics here. Uh, I want to show you guys the uh, – uh, we'll go back to tropical tidbits here. And I, I want to show you guys with this system, this is why we really don't know. I yeah. want you to notice a, a lot of these models take it over and under Hispaniola and, uh, and the Dominican Republic. If that happens, uh, we could have a stronger system. This one's the one that's worth watching. I know we're all doing this other one this weekend. I got I to gotta dial it at 11 o'clock and put updates in that play on five English-speaking stations, sports, the, the news, 96.9, Arrow. That they're playing on all the stations because this thing's coming through, and we got to make sure people don't panic. And it's literally like telling people, don't panic. This is no big deal. Um, but I have to put those in. The weather guys actually drop them in a drop box and then I dial in from home and put them in. So I have to be off by 11 because I have to dial in and actually put in the mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. weather report from Matt Devitt uh, that's going to go and air on all the radio stations. And then tomorrow, um, uh, Jake, the morning producer, is doing the first three and then I'm doing the second three tomorrow. I'm doing the uh, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Yeah, it is. It's kind of cool how that works. There actually has to be some dude that puts that stuff in. <laughs> anyway, I'm that dude. Uh, so um, any, any, uh, any other questions on hurricanes? Let me go back to this. I want to go back one more time to this. This is the problem with this one. Uh, this is the intensity scale that I showed you guys on the first storm. This is the second storm. Um, this one, there is a few models that have this thing strengthening quite a bit. So that's a little scary, but they are outlier models at this point. So nothing really to be too concerned about. But these are probably the same models that take it up above Hispaniola. Uh, and like I said, if this goes above Hispaniola, could be something to really watch. Okay, um, enough of that. Does anybody have any other questions on hurricanes while we're doing hurricanes? Okay, anything else? Last call. All right, guys, it is um, the website you're looking for is Mike's Weather page, or you can also use the hurricane resource on uh, the uh, Southwest Florida TechNet website. Both of them have a great hurricane resource for you. All right, let's go back to here and let's just do this. All right. Uh, Hey, there it is again, Mike's weather page. All right, you guys know that already. And we talked about the logo. For those of you who joined us late, that's our new logo here for the Southwest Florida TechNet. 
and uh, we've got uh, uh, Joseph and I put the finishing touches on it last weekend, and we're actually really happy with it. I think it came out really nice. So that's our new logo. We will be having that made into stickers and patches and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, watching the tropics, we've already done. Uh, hurricane approach broadcasts we're going to do on the Southwest Florida Tech Net YouTube channel right here on our YouTube channel. Uh, and not the Zoom if you're in Zoom, but on the YouTube channel. Uh, we are going to have a broadcast coming up uh, shortly. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys kind of what that's going to look like uh, so we can kind of discuss it a little bit. But it looks very similar to this. Uh, it's going to uh, actually be this uh, coming up right after I get done here. And basically what this is, uh, it's all the information. Now notice it's a little old. I'm going to update it before it goes live. Um, but uh, this will actually be live. And you can actually listen to two different scanner feeds. And you can go in there. And uh, in the description, you'll be able to see what scanners are on what feeds. It also... Uh, is on the little scroller thing at the bottom there. What's really cool is in the left channel, you're going to be able to hear a whole bunch of repeaters. And in the right channel, you're going to be able to hear a whole bunch of repeaters. It also includes SARNET, the NI4CE in Tampa, and uh, the 685, the NI4CE. It includes a bunch of them. The neat thing about this is, is you guys will actually be able to, um, if you're watching this, you can see the little radio in the corner there. Uh, that's actually one of the radios that you're listening to, and you can see what the arrow's pointing to is what you're actually listening to. So it's kind of cool. You can actually see what you're listening to. All the information's right there. It's a neat resource to hopefully interest people in ham radio and show them that we are involved in emergencies and that we get very involved in, in civic things and that it's important to, uh, to our community that ham radio is out here. And so that's kind of why I do this. So it also gets us hits and likes. I told you guys all about that earlier, but I just want to make sure you understand why we're doing this. Uh, so that's going to be coming up. That'll be going live right after we sign off here. Uh, and then you guys can check it out tomorrow when you get up. It should be going good. All right. Uh, the next thing is, uh, let's see, let me go back to this and to that. Oh, so many things. All right. Um, that, but anyway, that'll be on the YouTube channel, and uh, that is coming up. Uh, the next thing, donate your old equipment. We are still looking for old equipment. We did have some equipment donated uh, the other day. Uh, I've, I've had equipment donated by uh, four different people now. Uh, we have pressed most of it already into service. Uh, if you guys uh, see behind me in the view you've got right now, uh, these four systems right here are all donated systems. And right now, two of them are up and running doing stuff. And the other two, uh, this one is getting Linux installed in it tomorrow. Uh, and uh, this one over here is getting Linux installed in it tomorrow because their older systems are going to run much better with Linux. And so we're... What are you going to use? Uh, Joseph? He's still here? Let me hold on. Wait. What are we installing in these computers? We're, here, um, let me, here, let me try uh, it this way. Joseph, 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 what? Can you hear me? Can you hear me normally? Can you hear me normally? Yeah, now? we got you. Now. Okay, okay. I was, I was, I was uh, going out to the antenna and doing stuff outside, so bring the phone with me. That's why you're hearing it twice. Um, we're gonna be installing Pop OS, which is an Ubuntu-based distro. Um, it uh, is one of the easiest to install and set up. Mint is probably second place to it. Um, so it's uh, it's very easy to install. It has a good. Um, it's very. It, I'm running it right now. Actually, it's what I'm on at the moment. Um, they did some updates to the default desktop environment, which I really liked. So uh, that's why I've been sticking with it. And um, so yeah, we're gonna put Pop OS on there. And I've put Pop OS on a couple of old laptops in the past, and it breathes new life into them because the performance is just so much greater. So, oh, and the other thing that made me want to do it was uh, I got WSJTX working, uh, uh, MMS STV works. I got audio piping. So pretty much all the ham stuff I was doing on Windows can now be done on Linux. Um, and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to try some, uh, see if rig control worked with WSJTX on Linux. That's one thing. And, and Ian's got the, the cable and everything over there in the radio. Plus, it's a good computer to have. There's some tools you can do that are only on Linux with the RTL SDR. 
Um, so there's a bunch of ham radio stuff that works great on Linux. That would be good to have on one of our project computers. So, um, yeah, we're going to do that tomorrow probably. And, uh, yeah, we're actually going to do two of them right away. I, I've got yeah. two here that are, they're just, they've, they're like Vista machines that have windows 10 in them and they're just so it, it painfully slow. Oh, um, and, but you know, what's great about Linux is it, it runs like eight times faster than windows ever ran. So you can there's, put it there's in no a bloat. Vista machine. Yeah. There's nothing in it. You, we can put that in a Vista machine, strip it down, run just what we want to run on. And it's going to do great. Some mm. of the projects you guys don't realize some of the projects we're doing and these are all underway already. Okay. It's kind of, kind of weird. Um, you, while you're what? talking, while you're talking about this, I'm actually in the process of putting Linux on a, an, a Dell laptop that I did not give to you. So oh, that's, okay. that's been my, my project tonight. Now I'm trying to get a virtual box running so I can put uh, um, the new uh, Mac OS on it just to play around with it. Oh, that's going to be tough getting Mac OS to run on virtual box. Yeah. Good luck with that. I've tried that. It's very hard. And when you get it, video acceleration will not work, which means it's going to be very laggy and slow. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Okay, and I will not be doing that one here. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. You you had me with Mac. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah. The, 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 some of the projects we've got underway right now, just so you guys know, is um, we're we're hooking up a uh, an SSTV mirror. Um, and you guys will be able to actually we're going to have it on different frequencies each week. And you'll be able to actually dial in to a certain frequency at home and send SSTV images to the website directly over the radio. You're kind of technically sending them to me, but you know what I mean. And whatever you send to me vicariously will get posted on the website. So it's going to be cool. Like you can actually send a, a, a greeting from Rick uh, on SSTV and you send it in. And that will be on our front page of our website for a while. And then if you go back, you can go to a secondary page and you'll be able to see some of the older ones that are there too. So it's going to be really cool. It's a way to test your system and it's a way to garner interest. And we are going to start out with uh, VHF local, but we're eventually, uh, we're, we're talking about hooking this up to HF and, and seeing what we can get on it and, and doing different stuff. So, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be an SSTV mirror, and um, you basically will send an SSTV image to me, to the website, uh, on a certain frequency that will be right there on the website. And uh, if we get it, it'll pop up. You'll actually watch it pop up on the website. It may take a minute, but it'll pop right up on the website. The another thing we're working on, uh, this is actually in progress as well, uh, that Joseph's uh, installing in his chat is an actual stationary uh, satellite receiver for weather satellites. And we're actually going to publish the weather data right off the satellites right on to our website. And once again, explain to people that come there, this is live. We're doing this right now from our shack. This is something you can do if you get your license, you know. Actually, you don't even need a license for that. Yeah, license. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we won't tell them that. But... Um, now is that polar orbiter or get or go geostationary geostationary oh, yeah right. it's actually going to be both we're do he's doing geostationary i'm going to be doing polar orbit it's just further down on the list because yeah. polar orbit's going to require us to have uh an antenna that we're going to have to build and it's, this antenna has got four different elements and egg beater know, yeah and, and it's got a a closed line and it's got you know i don't know anyway uh, so we're just we're gonna have to figure all that out, but um, uh, we're, we're gonna do that too. I want to put that up to where every time a satellite goes over, you can go to the website and actually see the latest pass from the satellite right over, and then it will garner interest in this, and it will come up on searches, and people will be able to find it, and, and it'll get more interest into the hobby, which is really one of our main goals here. So those are all projects we're working on. And the Gary gave us computers. Uh, Steven, uh, W9GPI, gave me computers. Dan gave me computers. I always forget his call sign. I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, all these computers are being used. Uh, 
this one is uh this one's an old like business machine it's an amazing computer and you know what i'm doing with this computer right now you guys are not going to believe it i'm going to show you gary you're going to love this okay this computer over here you guys see this computer it's on ft8 right now it's working ft8 it's not actually transmitting because uh i'm not over there to tell it to go but it's receiving i want to show you guys something this computer is also in the zoom meeting and i can actually go in the zoom meeting if i can figure out how to do it here <laughs> i can actually go in I, yeah tell me about it uh i can actually go in the zoom meeting and uh Okay, there we go. I can go here and I can go screen capture and uh, check that out. So we're actually going to be able to use this computer to work FTA or work whatever we're working live right on the air. So here we go. Uh, we're live on FT8 on a different computer. I kept trying to run everything on the same computer, and that's where we're running into trouble. Uh, this computer is fast enough um, that as long as I don't hook any extra screens or anything else to it, uh, notice my rig control. Yes, I got rig control. Uh, my rig control uh, is hooked up right here, and I've got the – this is the sound card for the transmit, which I don't even have hooked up right now. Um, and the receive side's right here, and uh, the radio is right here. It's my FT100, and it's hooked up over there. And then I've got the the other sound card, the onboard sound card, sends me the alerts, which goes into my speaker here, which all my computers hook into one speaker that I can control the volume on. Um, that thing is amazing. So that's going to actually become the demonstrator computer for the show for this. Are you going to put Linux on that? Is that the one you're going to put Linux on? Um, I think we're probably going to keep Windows 10 on this one for a while because it's, okay. it's running okay with Windows 10. That's probably because it's got like a, a gajillion byte of memory. Yeah, I, um, I think it had 32 gig in there. Yeah, yeah. It has more memory than I do. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a great computer. The other two are slower, older computers. They're both getting the, uh, they're both getting the treatment tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and they're going to be amazing. Um, one of those is probably going to be pressed into service right away, uh, uh, streaming audio. And the other one may be the satellite server, or uh, I'm not sure what, but it will be doing something. And as I do with everybody that donates equipment, I'll always let you know what your stuff's doing. And anytime we offer a service through donated equipment, you'll get a chance to use it. Um, anyway. Over, I want to show you guys. I want to switch over here. I uh, give you a little bit of a tour here. Over here, um, what you see up top there, uh, behind that phone that you see there, is actually the radio that you see that display on, and that's actually the camera that's looking at the display on the on the radio. So that when you see uh, here, let me turn the share screen off over here. I'm sorry. Let me get rid of this. Uh, there we go. Okay, now you can see what I'm pointing at. Up there, you can see the phone up there uh, is actually um, taking a picture of the radio that's sitting behind the phone. And the reason that is, is that gives me this composite view right here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not that one. Uh, this one. Notice the radio in the left corner. They're talking on it right now on Sarnet. Notice the arrows on Sarnet. Yeah. And... Yep, and if I change if I changed my audio right here uh, to analog focus. And uh, I did run the generator just to make sure, so I'm not too overly concerned. I think it, you know, we. I'll switch it back. But, yeah, you could you could hear Sarnet, I'm sure, right? Uh, yep. That's uh, actually Sarnet coming through, probably just one ear. Okay, um, so this is that's what that camera is up there. What you're actually seeing is uh, the old Note 5 phone that's actually mounted in front of the radio. See the radio sitting behind it back there? And then um, the two computers below that, those two screens right there, those two screens were donated to me about three years ago by a coworker before I even got in the ham radio. So they're donated as well. Uh, below that, I got my, uh, you've got your, uh, your hubs. 
Yeah. Those two screens are hooked to the two computers that Dan gave. One of those is streaming Sarnet. One of those is streaming amateur radio. And I also used the one to do my, to track the space station. I used the other one over there. You can see that's got the SDR sharp and it's doing all the scanning. So all that's going on. And um, those are both donated computers too. And then the two laptops you see to the left, those are XP machines. One of them's not working well right now. The other one, streaming. It's been streaming the 685 and the 160, and it's been streaming them for weeks without fail. The others go off when the power fails and everything else. That battery in that old laptop still works, and it keeps it up long enough for the power to come back on. That thing has been up, and it's hooked to a bow fang, which stays up because it's on a battery. It's 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 an, on a little bow fang portable. And it's plugged in and it's got an external antenna. So I got two of the three feeds are on valve things and the third feed is on the SDR sharp over here. And then over here on this side, as I've already kind of showed you, I've got another SDR sharp hooked up to this computer, which I also have FT8 and the radio hooked up to it. So I can do a bunch of stuff with this. This is another computer Dan gave me. I have the SDR Sharp can be plugged into this one too. It's all set up to go. Uh, and it runs pretty good on scan mode. I can put it in scan mode, hook an antenna to it and scan whatever I need to scan with that. Uh, and then I can broadcast that on the radio. And like I said, this one is a Vista machine. Uh, and this one is actually an XP machine. And these um, are both gonna be converted to Linux tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to seeing old machines do great things again. I think it's, it's going to be a Yes, I think so. I, it's repurposing. You know, let me tell you something. I hate a disposable world. I don't, don't want to. I don't want to sound like some green person or whatever crazy person. But I just I, anytime I can repurpose something, I try to repurpose something. You know, and. Uh, uh, and, and being that I'm financially challenged sometimes because I put more time and energy into what I love versus what makes me money. Uh, and uh, so because of that, I end up a lot of times uh, repurposing things because that's what I have. And so it works out pretty good. Um, this entire broadcast tonight with all these cameras is brought to you by repurposed cell phones. Um, all my cameras are repurposed cell phones. You can actually see them um, in the camera I'm on now. This is the other camera that you see me in right here. It's just another repurposed cell phone. Um, I like doing that. I, I like reusing stuff. Um, so if anybody has any old equipment that they'd like to donate, I am looking for an HF rig. Uh, I'm looking for some old HF equipment that doesn't transmit anymore, something that's not worth fixing but it still receives well. I've got some purpose for that. Uh, I also have purpose for a transceiver uh, that maybe does uh, 20 or 40. I'm looking to put our first FT8 stream up. What, I'm, what I really wanna do, and I've already got a location for this. I've already got a location for this. My mother's house, she's already agreed. I'm going to set up an FT8 rig. Uh, basically, I'm gonna set up an audio interface Actually, I should say uh, Joseph and I are going to set up because he's the actual brains behind the operation. Um, but we're going to set up an audio link between the radio at my mother's house to whoever wants to use it. And so all you have to do is dial into this radio, which is going to be hooked to a little Raspberry Pi and, uh, and fed over the Internet over a program like TriCast or something. And all you'll do at home is put up WSJTX and run your virtual audio cable program that we gave you guys a while back and hook in my audio from this radio into your computer as if it was local audio. And you're all set. You used my radio as if it was your radio. And it's on Vox. So anytime you send sound to my radio, it transmits. There's no reason for remote rig control. 
There's no reason for remote dial-ins. There's no reason for remote desktops or team viewers or any of that crap. I really think we found the easiest way to do this because why do you need rig control? You're not changing the channel. You're not changing the wattage. You're not changing anything. You're going to dial in and you're going to use it the way it is. You can adjust your audio input level, which adjusts your power output. You can do that. You can adjust your audio input levels because there's some tactics there. And you can adjust your waterfall where you're transmitting. You can adjust all that stuff. But as far as the face of the radio, when you're using FT8, what do you use on the face of the radio? The only thing I ever have to use is the uh, um, the filter width. That's it. Yeah. And again, with FT8, that's something you could probably just set it and forget it. Yeah. Well, yeah. With my radio, is when it switches when it switches bands, it it switches the uh, right. the width. So we're talking about something that we're going to set it on uh, seven dot zero seven four upper side band set the width properly for ft8 set everything set turn all the filters off turn everything off and hook it up and just let it sit there with an open squelch and then you just dial in and just use the audio stream dump it into your ft8 and it decodes and then when you send audio back to it, it the transmitter will come on when it hears the audio and send it out i'm telling you guys this is going to work if it doesn't, you get your money back. Because <laughs> I haven't asked Double. for any. So. <laughs> Double. Double. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's, uh, let's. Anything else on that? All right. As mentioned earlier, and I do want to just bring this up one more time to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, I have a new schedule at work. Um, our, that show I produce, the Drive with Trey Radel, uh, we have been moved to a three hours now. And They've given me the eight o'clock. They've given us the eight o'clock hour, uh, or I'm sorry, the seven o'clock. So we're now going to be on from uh, five o'clock all the way till eight. We go off at eight. I'm going to be able to leave at seven twenty-seven on uh, Friday nights. I've already made these arrangements. Um, I've got my call screener trained to where she's going to be able to finish the show out. Um, and I'm going to be able to leave in time to get home. I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted to re just change the show to a different night or change the show to a different time. When would that be exactly? I don't, I, this is not a good time. And every other time sucks even more. Yeah. So um, I don't know when to, I didn't know what to do. So I just literally made it to where I'm going to get off in time to be here for eight o'clock. So someone will start the rag chew at 7.30. There's not a lot of rag chewing anyway sometimes. But uh, somebody will start the rag chew at 7.30, and I'll join just before 8 o'clock, and I'll jump in there and get on it. Hey, Ian, uh, another thought yeah. occurred. You could set it up where you could remotely control it from the station, uh, you know. Yeah, but then I got to sit work, there all night. No, yeah. no, no. Because yeah. if I'm at work, then I'm at work. Yeah, okay. I'm okay. sure there's a camera to be had someplace in that building. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't want to do it there. Ah, uh, the TechNet newsletter. Hey guys, um, we've got uh, thirty something subscribers now on the TechNet newsletter, and I've got nothing but positive feedback. The um, the amateur radio group down in so uh, Southwest Florida amateur radio group down in uh, Naples uh, is actually republishing a lot of our stuff now, and they put links for us down in their in their, uh, their stuff down there now, and. Um, I'm now listing things for um, for the tech group, the tech team, for FMARC, for cars, and for the um, amateur radio group of Southwest Florida or whatever the one down in Naples is called. Um, I'm actually going to be listing all their stuff in there, the different events that all the different clubs are doing. Uh, it goes right in with all the news and space weather and terrestrial weather and all the other stuff that you guys have been seeing in there already. So. Uh, it's going to continue to get better, and uh, uh, there's, I've, like I said, I've already got several people using my news for other things. So uh, it's, it's, it's been going pretty well. I've been putting out about two of these a week, and uh, like I said, nothing but positive. If you want to try it out, 
you try it out. And then if you don't like it, all you have to do is send an email with the word unsubscribe and I'll immediately take you off the list. It's real simple. Um, it's nothing automated. It's something I do manually. So it's not something that's going to start blasting out a bunch of emails. It never has any advertisements other than advertisements for free things that are amateur radio like this net. Yeah. Um, no malware detected. <laughs> there's no malware. There's no banner ads. There's no click throughs. There's none of that stuff. Everything on there is legitimate nonprofit stuff. Um, all right. And uh, the next thing is the newsletter again. Okay. And uh, the we're looking for people Ooh. to join. We got about, uh, I think we got 11 members now that have joined the club. Um, looking for more. Uh, we are going to start up meeting, regular meetings where we're writing the bylaws and stuff. We're just kind of, we're literally kind of just waiting right now to maybe get a few more people signed up. So if you're wanting to sign up, please understand this has nothing to do with your membership at another club. And it, you don't have to be local. So uh, just sign up. It doesn't cost you a thing. We just want people that are interested and will show up for our meetings and, and give us some input and help us get things going. It'll be fun. Try it out. Uh, our TechNet Club repeater. I've been trying very hard to monitor this. I know Joseph and I have talked on it about ten times this week, probably or maybe five. Um, and uh, but it's I've been, been calling going. out all day today. Yeah, yeah. We tried. We've been trying to call on it um, and trying to get people to start using it more. Um, I don't know. I, if you guys, if you don't have it in your radio, throw it in your radio. Give us a call. We're, uh, we also use this as like our working channel when we're doing projects and stuff. So we literally, you'll hear us just pop up on this channel and say, did that work? KO4 EFS, you know, uh, because we literally <laughs> kind of use this as our working channel. So do you not find that repeater awfully noisy? It has a no. bit of a crackle. The yeah, repeater I, has it, a weird crackle issue. It just seems to me that it's awfully noisy. I've, I've monitored a few times and. I even put my call out a few times, but it just always seems so, so noisy and and crappy. Actually, well, it the range may be somewhat. Well, actually, we were surprised by the coverage that it has. Um, but the um, it's uh, it works really well actually for us here. The signal's full quieting. The audio is fine. It just has the only the only quirk. That sounds something like what you're describing would be it has a bit of a crackle at the beginning uh, when it's IDing itself. When there's a squelch tail, it'll crackle sometimes. Um, That's what as I for hear too. Once noisy. The yeah, once the person starts talking, it seems to be fine. Where I notice the problem on it is every now and then when it IDs, which I love it because it has a really short ID, but when it IDs, yeah. it goes, dee -dee -dee -dee, and when it starts that, there'll be this loud, like, frying eggs all over the top of the of the uh uh call and then yep. it won't do it the next three times it's it's weird but i never hear that over like audio people talking yeah so i don't know it, I, uh john i don't it hasn't been too bad of course we're exercising it now so i doubt that has anything to do with it but we've been using the heck out of it it's been nice if it breaks hopefully somebody fixes it yeah, that's the only know. thing. I don't know. I don't even know who to call if it breaks. <laughs> Always a 220 repeater. Yeah. yeah oh, I've been well, uh, using this um, 220 handheld that uh, Steve Smith gave me, and I actually have a great signal from the uh, from the shop. And uh, I talked to a few people today on it. I talked to Tom and I talked to Bob. Um, and it seems like it's working really well. Uh, it's a pretty cool repeater. I just wish it was a little bit more active because I, I I monitor all day, and the only traffic I heard was from me calling out. I think we had about 10 on the net Wednesday night. You know, yeah, I checked in on the net Wednesday. I've checked in the last couple of weeks. I'm trying to support the buck and the quarter net. If you guys yeah. have 220. Believe me, it's night. going to become more active. Oh, yeah. We got some more people that are got radios that have got, uh, you got, uh, um, who is it? W K4 PAX, W4 PAX. He's got to get his antenna going, and there's a few others too. But it's also getting an all-star connection. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's probably going to be the next one connected up to the uh, FMARC all-star system. Are they planning on just leaving that on all the time or just hook it up on occasion? My understanding is that the plan 
is to connect the two they've already got connected, which is the yellow repeater in Lehigh and the, uh, oh gosh, the W2PAX repeater down in Bonita Springs. Yeah. And the Cape Coral, the 225 the red repeater. Yeah. And the 220 machine all linked together other than during an Aries activation. Oh. What, what this will do uh, is allow people like our snowbirds and people from out, out of the area to call in on Echo Link and, and talk to the local people. And there's even been discussion about moving some of the local net onto the system once that it's determined to be working and stable yeah. where uh, some of our snowbirds could uh, could call in via echo link or by all all star yeah. nodes and participate in the nets. I think that's so important. I think it's great that they're doing this. Um, I uh, I was saddened that they were going to have to do it with the smaller repeaters, but I understand why. Um, it's uh, it's an ownership thing, but the problem is uh, it's going to be they they're going to need four or five of them to do it. Well, that's what they're looking to do, and so I think I think it's a good thing. I think it's uh, definitely moving. Well, two and, you know, and I'll tell you what, John, if if they can get all five of these things up and stable, and you move your net over there, any of these nets move over there, I like like the newbie net especially, um, move over there, you will get more participants. I guarantee it. Oh yeah. Two of the now, now are... you're going to be now you're going to be permeating ten miles into Collier County. You know what I'm saying with that right. Benita repeater, and right. it, where before the six eight five was barely getting south of Gladiolus unless you had a base rig. So, well, you know, well, two I, of them are connected up now. Yeah. The equipment is here in hand to connect a third one up, and the equipment has been ordered to connect the fourth one up. So there will be at least four repeaters connected to a hub, hopefully within a week. That's nice. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I wish I could have been a part of it, but uh, it wasn't meant to be, I guess. Oh, well, um, a connected repeater system is so important. And it's also important that uh, with this is that they'll have remote control of it. So, um, the, the moment we Aries activate, they can hit a button and it all goes back to normal single operation because uh, at that point, uh, we want the exact opposite of what we want during a normal day. What we want during a normal day is the repeaters to almost seem artificially busy. We want we want them to be busy. We want them yeah. to sound busy. We want them to, to be active with activity, bristling with life. But during an activation, we want to separate everything out so that we can get just the right people on just the right communication. Right. Lines Maximize the right our people. resources. Yeah. So I, I think this is a perfect thing where we've got the best of both worlds. Yep. Should work good. And people are worried about, well, during a disaster, uh, this, the, the internet may not be up. That's fine. We're not, we don't need this for a disaster. Right. This is for, this is for casual use. That's what we've got Sarnet for. That's right. That's right. We've got connected system for that. And we've also, um, during an and activation, HF we need a separated system for that so that we can get uh, the different parts of the county separated on their own channels. If we had the county connected on one frequency during an activation, it would be chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Having your, you know, all of your police tack channels on one thing, that'd be absolutely chaos. Yeah. Nuts. Right. Yeah. We definitely need the, the separation with, during an activation. So I, I agree with it. I think it's an amazing thing. I think it's awesome. Um, all right. So uh, the last thing I had, guys, was to spread a word, spread the word about the net, get it out there, let people know. And the other, only other thing I had was I am looking for people to help us co-host the net. I can't get anybody to come on and co-host the net, and I don't know why. Um. I don't, I'd be I'll happy to help you. I just don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't we'll start know. learning stuff and then come help us. <laughs> okay. Well, teach me, Joseph. I'm really oh, looking that, for somebody mm. that's <laughs> really looking for JSA call. I'm looking for somebody that can do FL Digi, that can give us a nice 
tutorial on that. And I'm always looking for anybody that wants to work something and allow us to watch. And I don't care what it is. Um, as long as it's legal with a license. Um, I'll do a little stuff. Yeah. We're going to hack some nah. out of Miami. No, but I'm talking about, I want to, I want to do, I want people to say, okay, I've got this thing I do. I go on F J S A and I talk to people. Good. Show us. I want somebody to actually screen capture your screen and do it. And we'll sit here and watch that. I, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Um, I'm looking for people that will instruct also that will teach us how to do FTA or, or a JS eight or whatever it is. Um, I'm also looking for short topics, people that don't want to take big topics, but you want to take a small topic. Maybe you want to take one little thing that it's only a 20 minute thing, but I'd like to do it. Well, that's fine. I, I'd love to have you do that as well, because I, there's room for that, too. We can do many topics. So, I mean, I, I'm pretty much open to whatever. I will tell you guys between us here, the well's running dry. I've only been a ham for 14 months. And I've run through everything that I've already learned how to do myself. And I've run through everything that I already knew before I started. This is it. I really don't have anything else. So if you guys have anything, just get with me and let's set it up. Yeah, you've got a week up. to think about it. Well, and yeah, you know what? Joseph nuts. and I always put together something, don't we? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they are good. You know, and this was it pretty gets good. close I, sometimes. It gets it close does. sometimes, yeah. I I love it. I'll send him the the link for the slideshow so he can work on it. And he'll pull the link up, and the name of the slideshow is "I have no idea." <laughs> Go on, I've already got the whole template for the slideshow and all the ending slides in, and the beginning all made, and everything all picked out. I've already picked out the curtains and the drapes and the light fixtures, and we don't even know what we're doing yet. <laughs> and the worst first I'll be, I don't know what I'm doing. The next one will be deer and headlights. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we caught this was Joseph this week came up with the mobile installations. I thought that was great. Yeah. And, worked out uh, good. I thought that was a good one. That's something everybody will eventually work into needing to do. Uh, unless you take it somewhere and have them install it. Yeah. These uh, stereo shops can do that, but. That probably costs some money. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. It's not that big a deal to install something. No, it isn't. I got a question for the uh, technically inclined here, radio related. Um, if that's okay, are, do you want to do anything else, or are we like at the? No, we're we're in the open rag two the section. Or, you know, whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, absolutely. All right. If, um, if, if we're going to get down to the point where we're talking about the birds and the bees, I'll go ahead and end the recording. Yeah, but okay. uh, but, if, but if, if, if it's still radio stuff, I'll leave it going. Okay. Um, so I uh, drive a 2004 Chevrolet Suburban. All right. And um, the stereo is doing something weird. So when I start the car in the morning at like nine, it's not cold inside, but it's not super hot yet the stereo will not put out any audio to the speakers. It's only once the radio has been on for about 20 minutes that the sound will suddenly come through the speakers. Now, if it's a really hot day and it's like 120 inside the car and I turn it on, it'll work immediately. So it seems like it's a heat related issue. So once some component inside of there heats up, it starts working. Uh, because the radio does, I pulled it out of the dash, and that thing does get pretty toasty once it's been on for a little bit. But my guess is there's some kind of component in there that's degraded over time to the point where it only works when it's above a certain temperature. What kind of component would do that? My guess was capacitors. Um, I can't Usually think of anything it's else. Around. Usually, the other when, thing when is something a solder, overheats, it turns off. A solder connection can do that too. Yeah, yeah it could be cool. that. Yeah, that can do it. It's um, like the old-fashioned TVs. The tubes have to warm up first. Yep. yep. <laughs> See, yeah. That that is. Is. That that are glowing. See yeah. if any of the what's are glowing? The filaments. You don't know about filaments. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had tubes. 
Do you have any of that cold spray? The stuff cold you- spray? Oh, yeah. yeah, like where you turn an air can upside down? Yeah. yeah, and yeah, that, or there's actually stuff you can buy uh, at electronic shops, which will freeze things. And what you do is get that thing going, and when it comes on, then you start spraying internal components. Hmm. Find what the thermal is. I mean, it's a it good may, idea. It may be a component, or like I said, it may be a solder joint. <laughs> yeah, it could or even, or if it's... Just- you could just trash it and go to Walmart and spend a hundred bucks and and replace Get a it. new one. I was thinking I, I about that. I don't think that'll fix it. I you don't used think to so. have it. No, I used to have a 2005 Tahoe, which is somewhat similar. It's almost. It's going. The interior is going to be identical. Yeah. Well, the problem I had was that the ground wire from the engine to the chassis was was. Uh, yeah, you know, intermittent, corroded, messed up. The whole thing was terrible. And that used to give me all sorts of problems, including the radio coming on, going off, not being able to start, being able to start, because they use the, uh, uh, I don't know, the control box, if you want to call it, where the CPUs are, actually uses the engine as a ground, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the car uses the chassis. Now, it's at the back of the engine, uh, and what I did, I just replaced it with a new ground. Uh, but it's at the back of the engine, between the firewall and the engine. And I've known a number of cars that will cause that problem. And then there's another ground, which is inside the hinge of the driver's door. And there's another ground there. Seen that, that one, yeah. Yeah, that will cause the same problem. Now, you know, I mean, we're talking 15-year-old cars now, so it could be a million things other than that, but... That was the case of mine. When I replaced that ground lead or I put a new one in completely from the engine to the chassis, it was like driving a completely different car. Okay, so, yeah, I'll um, I'll crawl under there and see if I can see it. Um, the radio, I, like, like I, I have the, um, the radio, the ham radio. Uh, it works okay. It's, I don't believe it's grounded to the f- chassis. I might be. I can't remember. One of the the power comes from the trailer brake controller, but the um, the ground may or may not be chassis. I'm not sure. Um, the radio though itself has power. Everything everything works fine. It's just this. It just doesn't come on until it's warmed up. Um, I'll still check that though. I'll give it a look. See. Um, yeah, you can do it by just putting another ground on and seeing if that makes any improvements. Well, um, that's what I did, yeah. and, it, and as I say, the whole thing became a completely different car. I yeah, I still had it. <laughs> I only got rid of it three years ago when I moved down here, and I, and I bought a Subaru, which is a great car, but it's a waste because I've only done like seventeen thousand miles in the last three years. My Tahoe would have been, and I liked it because you could throw everything in it. It's huge. Oh yeah, this one I, I love that Suburban. I mean, I, I'm worrying because we might need to get a new vehicle soon because like the the. The back rear right uh, quarter panel glass is is leaking or the roof is leaking or something because there's a few drips showing up. And uh, I pulled the, the the stuff apart today looking for the source. And I couldn't find it. If it gets worse and other stuff starts happening, I have to get a new vehicle, but I don't want to because I really like the older vehicles. And you can live in that thing. I know. It's huge. I mean, you had a I Tahoe, so that's in, shorter. I slept in mine. I don't know. Yeah, you can Listen, put a uh, air mattress in there. You can put a normal yeah. uh, twin mattress in there. Now, Joseph. No, you can put a queen. I used to have a queen in mine. You could absolutely yeah. <laughs> take the seats out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I slept in mine oh, a bunch of times. That's what you got to do when you go on a road trip. One person driving, one person sleeping in the back sleeping. on the exactly. on a proper bed. <laughs> and there's plenty of room to put stuff under the seats because the seats fold up properly. You know, they don't just yeah. drop down on top of the other seat. They're great cars. Yeah. I wish I still had mine. They just look cool, too. Modern cars look like they, like, have faces on them. I don't know what it is. I don't like the aesthetics of modern cars. No, it's all those things they have hanging off. You know, the lights have got a kind of standing stick out and that stuff jamming. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Crap. 
You know, they look <laughs> like a spacecraft. The, the lights look like they should come off a spacecraft or something. And yeah, they, they do. These, <laughs> they have all these fake cooling vents. You know, oh, down gosh. The side. <laughs> yeah, on the front and down the side. No. Oh, I hate that. Yeah, it's got to love a false product. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so ground so, strap and uh, spray yeah. starts start cooling stuff down and see where it goes. It could be the amplifier because the amplifier is, is built in there. I yeah, did. It, that, if the radio's I, coming on. It sounds like it's probably the audio amp. Yeah. You think? Yeah, the amp itself. Yeah, because uh, I found the heat sink for the amp. It's it's built into the back of the radio. And yeah, like y'all are saying, I should just go and buy one. And I was I was thinking because then I'd get like Bluetooth and stuff, you know. And I went on Amazon looking for an amp, and I found this one that looked really cool. But then it was just, oh my gosh, the amount of chinesium in that thing was just appalling. It had an audio equalizer, like visualizer with the little bars that move, but it wasn't real. It's just an animation that <laughs> plays this <laughs> fake visualizer. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> if you're too lazy to code this thing in and you don't and you can't do it within the budget that you have, then don't have a visualizer that you can't turn off. It was stuck on. So you're stuck with this flashing thing. It's like, why? <laughs> I don't understand the way these Chinese engineers, what are they thinking when they make this stuff? <laughs> I'm not sure they think, but you know. <laughs> it's like anyway, the t-shirts yeah. and, the, uh, and the cars. They put just words on them that don't, don't make any sense. They yep. just put words on their t-shirts, you know, an English word. <laughs> they haven't got a clue of what it means, and they'll put two English words together, you know, like I don't know, field and bus. You know, <laughs> it's just worse than Google Translate or yes, anything yeah. followed by off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah. That's just that's. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll I'll give that a, a test this weekend, maybe and try and figure out what's wrong with that. The uh, speaker wires go directly into it, so whatever it is, they um, I don't think it's the there's like an external amp anywhere. No problem. But yeah, no. Oh, that's a good idea to try and cool specific areas of it down and see what happens. That's what I'll do. Hmm. Oh, and I think I figured out what was wrong with my uh, Go's satellite problem. It was uh, when I first installed it, the error rate was really low and it was working beautifully. And then uh, it, the error rate just kind of slowly meandered up into the very bad range. I think I know it was causing it. I think number one, I cooked my low noise amplifier. Um, and the, the dongle is uh, known for having reduced sensitivity on the gigahertz band when it gets hot. And it must have gotten to like 200 degrees in there because those dongles get very like even just sitting in an air conditioned room, if you're running it up in the gigahertz, it'll get too hot to touch. And I had this thing in a tiny Pelican case outdoors in the Florida heat, which was, I, I figured, oh I figured the dongle would be okay. And, you know, as long as it didn't have the pie in there, it'd be okay. But no, I don't think so. Um, Cause now my low noise amplifier is just not doing anything. So uh, I got another yeah, one coming tomorrow. A little freezer to put it in. I went, so at work, we have a dumpster and there's like an air conditioning company next to us. And I found this like heat sink. It's like this big, it's this big chunk of metal. That's this giant heat sink. And I'm going to use thermal glue and I'm going to stick it to the dongle and the LNA. <laughs> so I've got this, I'm going to not put it in the Pelican case. Cause that just, <laughs> so yeah, I think I, I fried something like legit fried it from actual heat. Those not dongles get hot. Store. Like you said, just sitting. If I go right now to the one over here that's on scan, it'll be hot to the touch, and it's just scanning two meter stuff, you know. You know, you're so. in trouble. You reach over and touch it, and you hear, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> frying bacon. Yeah, <laughs> yep. be your finger that fries. <laughs> yeah, you will just burn your finger on these if you run it up in the high frequencies for a while. It'll like like if you're running the uh, ADSB. That's up at the one gigahertz. You will burn your finger if you touch these. Yep. They get really hot. So, yeah. But hopefully this weekend I'll have that ghost thing up and running and we got to figure out the software for getting on the website. But we'll see what happens. Yeah, this is all going to be good. Um, 
I'm looking forward to getting these. These are all going to be fun projects. I'm looking for, I, I've never used um, um, Linux. I've never used an other operating system. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much a Windows guy, uh, Windows and an Android. I, I don't even use Apple. I don't even know how to use Apple. I, I don't use it. Once you use Linux for a lot of things, you won't want to go back to Windows. Yeah, I can that's what I'm hoping you're going to see here. Either please wait or uh, or not responding or down. Please wait while we do updates. And oh, geez. okay, you don't even have to. Uh, I just uh, did some updates on my system while the Zoom call was running. You don't have to reboot for system updates. Yeah. And the updates take like five seconds. Like you, like even if you have this giant list of packages being updated, you hit update, it runs for like thirty seconds, and it's done. And I bet the biggest thing is, is you actually get to choose. Oh yeah. What and yeah. when you update? If you don't want to update, you could install it today and never update it once. In fact, there's a custom. There's a there's a version called the light the uh, LTS version. I think that means lifetime s- time support. Too. Yeah, that's what lifetime I'm support. Yeah, you install that, and that's basically designed to function indefinitely. I, I think that's what the point of it is. You install it, and it'll just function indefinitely without ever being updated. Um, they use it for servers and stuff. But you don't have to update. Like I've got one system I don't update, but every you know several weeks I just let it go. But uh, I don't have the thing interfering with what I'm doing, trying to do an update. That's what drives me crazy. Yep. You will never get the force shutdown. You will never get the mandatory update. Yeah. Ever. It's pretty awesome. There's a whole lot of benefits to it. Absolutely. I don't run Windows unless I absolutely have to. And I'm trying to figure out a way to get around the one thing that I I like the N1MM plus uh, logging. And I'm trying to figure out how to get it run under wine. I haven't done it yet, but I'll get there. Hmm. You have uh, wine tricks and. Uh, yep. I yep. got all that stuff there. So I've just got to take the time and try to get it to go. That's what I want to try to do is get that guy run under wine. If I do, uh, you won't see me running that much windows. I'll stay away <laughs> from it if I can. It drives me up the wall. I bet you'll get it working. A lot of that ham stuff seems to work pretty good on uh, Linux. I uh, ran WSJTX under Linux, under Wine, um, yeah. and I ran, and also the native version, but yeah, right, a little uh, there. native version. The weird thing was the native version for me, it didn't, ha- it, the audio output, like when it wants to go into transmit mode, it would go into transmit mode, but it would only sometimes, like none of the, device i would have it playing out the main speakers and there would be no audio coming out and even the little volume indicator would show that there was no audio going out the main speakers even though it was set to default it should have worked the input worked just fine but output didn't work and i switched to uh, the windows version under wine and it, it installed in one click it was just as easy to run as the native version and that audio worked out that one worked fine with the audio so that's the only drawback because sometimes you got to tinker a little bit, but I think it's worth it if you're technically minded. And even if you don't want to tinker, most stuff works just fine. And you, and you, and there's always duck, duck, go. You can find out, you know. Oh, you yeah. Search. Yeah. I hardly ever use Google. That's what I use all the time. Duck, duck, go. And uh, that's a search engine. Yep. And they'll find it on there. Yep. Sometimes you got to spend an after. If you have a really bad problem, you might have to spend an afternoon searching stuff. But um, that could be a bit frustrating sometimes. But I'm always trying to do a very, very niche, unheard of stuff on here, trying to run really old games that no one knows about. And it's a nightmare trying to make it work yourself because you don't know what to do. But that's my own fault. If I don't do that, this thing works perfectly all the time. Like I said, for most stuff, I run Linux. Yeah, I got Linux on the laptop, and I got Linux on the main computer. And uh, I have it on the Raspberry Pi. Oh, yeah, and that's the other thing, Ian. Um, <laughs> when we install this, it'll help you a lot to understand. Because, like, when I got a Raspberry Pi, um, 
I didn't know how to use it at all. Well, actually, I bought the Pi after I knew new Linux. But when I decided to make the jump and install Linux for the first time, I learned so much in one day about how to operate this stuff. And um, it was amazing. It was a really cool learning experience because I just learned like a, a lot about Linux. And now I know enough to use a Pi. And um, yeah, it'll be a good thing to learn and know how to do because it's very useful. Well, I figured this would be a good way to, you know, learn how to do all this stuff. You know, because that I'm picture be there the with pie. the phone with a hurricane in the middle, it looks yeah. like it looks like somebody's trying to flush ice cream down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I guess it does. It even swirls the right way. <laughs> now you gotta yeah, play guess the eye. Which yeah. hurricane is that from? Looks like Charlie, and maybe Charlie. Well, in that case, the other one looks like somebody's trying to flush a rainbow. <laughs> Just saying. Somewhere flushing the rainbow. <laughs> this, is my new, my, this is my new view. You like this one? Yeah. Yeah. I like that command center view, too. Get the whole setup there. Yeah, that's yeah. actually another old phone back there. Yeah, you old phones the, make pretty good. You mean the bald spot view? Yeah, that's the bald <laughs> that that bald back cam. there is the bald the bald spot view camera. The bald spot there. cam. Bald yep. cam. Yep. <laughs> that bottom me. The bald cam. Every hair that falls out is another one I don't have to cut. <laughs> All right, you don't have to watch it either. Or I, don't, I don't care about hair. I don't. Hair's something you need to get some. Other than that, you don't need hair. That was Miami. What about that got, view? Is that, is that better? There you go. I mean, <laughs> it's like, uh, what is it like? When they have those extremely dramatic TV <laughs> shows where it like has 30 camera angles yeah, of some guy's yeah. face for like five minutes after some dr dramatic event occurs, it's like. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> or it could be a dramatic video of a police shooting from four body cams or a Brady Bunch episode. Who knows? <laughs> I've been really working on there. Yeah, I've been working on different ones with my uh, with my system there. Yeah, I could paint that or something. There we go. That's better. <laughs> I could paint that or something. Paint the ball spot. Yeah, you could just well they make that stuff. You just <laughs> shoot a little on there and it's you know. Or you could go and have it tattooed or something, you know. <laughs> they used to sell this spray that you spray on your hair and it makes your hair thicker and it also makes your your scalp darker so that you don't know and i'm like i'm like that's only going to work if you're trying to get laid in a dark bar i mean really <laughs> and then they funny uh, notices dark. that a real dark bar i mean because this stuff i there's no way this is going to fool anybody that knows anything about anything about anything and if you they might, realize it it's going to have the opposite effect you may wind up looking like that pink haired woman on the olympics I'd rather just find a woman that knows that I'm comfortable with who I am and is comfortable with who I am too. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes the most sense. Yeah, I, uh, I, I have a later in life marriage and I, it's worked out great for us. I have no divorces. She has uh, one divorce and one dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she gets rid of one way or the other. I always say. You're next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how she's going to get rid of me. Unfortunately, like, she tells me she goes, I divorced the first one, I killed the second one. And then she just stands there and stares at me. Hope she doesn't plug all your radios into 220, 240. Yeah, there you go. I don't know what she's Ooh. gonna do. Gas my shack one night with me in it. She plugged but, it into the dryer plug. <laughs> but no, my wife and I have a great relationship. She likes uh, ham radio because it, it keeps me out of her hair. Um you know, we do stuff together. We and when we're not together, I do my stuff. She does her stuff, so it works out good. 
We have a good relationship. Yeah, that works. No complaints. No complaints. Yeah. That's unusual. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, we've been together 10 years and we have very few arguments, very few issues. We we work together. We're a team. We approach everything from from that point of view. And uh, you know, we both we both work. We both have income. We both do what we have to do. We, you know, we own our house, our van. We own everything. You know, it, it is what it is. We don't have a lot, but we own. What we have. Yeah. Well, and that's so, uh, a lot to be said for that. Oh, hey, the 11 p.m. weather's in. Oh. What are they yeah. saying? Twenty-three ten. Well, no, I gotta, I gotta actually put it in here. I don't know if I can. I'm gonna try to do that here. Wow, I got you guys yeah. on the. I'm literally dialed into the station. Yeah. Here, I'll oh, show I'm you guys. You guys are, you guys are gonna laugh. Oh, I want to see this. Yeah, I'm literally dialed into the station, and now I'm patching you guys into what I'm doing at the station. I think the cone <laughs> went further west. You guys can't hear that, though, can you? No. Uh, I, don't think so. I see the... Uh... Adobe Audition. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to go ahead, guys, and I'm going to end the broadcast for tonight. Okay. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast for tonight, and, uh, and then we're going to go from there. Uh, so let me just hit that. Uh, so let's just do this. I'm going to go ahead and say good night, everybody. This is uh, right. the... Uh, Southwest Florida TechNet. Uh, you guys can hang around if you'd like afterwards. Uh, we'll hang around for a few minutes uh, and talk. But uh, we are going to go ahead and end the broadcast and the recording at this point. Uh, visit us uh, next Friday night at 8 p.m. for the Southwest Florida TechNet. Uh, and you can find out more at www.swfltech.net. Everybody have a great night out there and keep your head down for the tropical storm. And next weekend, we get to see Ian Beam from the station back over to his shack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, literally. That would be the only way it works. All right. <laughs>